Um, Alex, uh, so thank you very much everyone for coming to World of Fish uh, for this very important day. Um, this is our very first brand new sound system, but I'm sure that's not the reason why we're here today. We're here um, for a different reason, of course, and I would like to welcome you all. And uh, I was asked to give a brief uh, welcome remark uh, to welcome you all, particularly um, those who came, came from very far. Uh, and uh, of course, those who came from our sister institutions in Malaysia, in the country as well. So a very warm welcome uh, to World Fish. And uh, I just want to share a bit personal story uh, with you all uh, today. And um, talking about fish bays and my acquaintance with fish bays, I want to take you back to the 1990s when a new nation was born in the Horn of Africa, a country called Eritrea. And um, I am from Eritrea myself. A young nation was born in the 1990s. There was a lot of enthusiasm to build a nation. And therefore, the obvious answer to the, some of the socioeconomic challenges that we were facing as a young nation uh, was um, offered by the sea or is the bounty of the sea. At least that was the, what was um, seen as one of the greatest opportunities or potentials that the country has. And um, as, as such, quite a number of us young people then decided to study marine biology and fishery science because that was seen as uh, uh, the nation's, you know, where the nation's future light and therefore that's how we can contribute to this young nation then. And um, unprecedented, I remember, I recall in 1997, um, the first president of Eritrea, who by the way is still the first president of Eritrea, um, uh, made a statement on the national TV um, stating that um, the maximum sustainable yield of the Eritrean Red Sea was about 80,000 tons per year, which was huge for that small nation of only 3.5 million people then. And therefore, it was no brainer. We advocated that we can feed our people using fish, right? And then we start asking questions, where did that figure come from, the 80,000 tons per year of maximum sustainable yield? And we realized it was based on um, a study that was done in 1950s, which was a study that did a stock assessment. And based on that, uh, we were told our MSY was 80,000 tons per year. Um, but um, of course, you know, to challenge that, we didn't have any data, right? And um, therefore, the government's first reaction was, as many would, in order to feed the population, right? Generate foreign currency um, or hard reserve, plus generate employment for the people. One of the options was partly leasing the access to the sea to foreign vessels, right? Or um, train people to become, you know, professional fisher folks as well. And thereby to meet those uh, socioeconomic and um, other development objectives. Therefore, um, for us, the challenge that time was we didn't have any policy for that young nation. If we were to allow anyone to come and hoover up the fish from the Red Sea then, how do you regulate that? What data or knowledge do we have to restrict effort or input, let's say mesh size, where to fish, or how much to extract? And where do you restrict access in certain um, breeding or nursery grounds, for instance? When do you close the, uh, the sea during certain breeding or spawning season? To do so, you require sufficient amount of data and knowledge. Forget about the ecosystem-based management or 
human rights based management, et cetera, et cetera. Just simple, the input and output control to regulate the fishery better and manage it sustainably. That was a significant challenge. Therefore, the question is how do you do that without a comprehensive understanding of our fishery, as I said? And uh, for instance, the breeding and spawning season, size at first maturity, or the simple length weight relationships, no data whatsoever, right? And as you all know, it's still the same problem now. We don't have access to academic journals even to do our desk-based review and just to gauge in terms of what would work and what wouldn't work. So literally I'm talking about no data whatsoever. And many of us were trained then to do a lot of you know, population dynamics, whether it's through the application of simple gonadosomatic index or doing some histological work in the laboratories without any machinery that is, using mechanical microtome, I'm sure many of you have done that, dipping the tissue in different solutions of you know, alcohol and xylene, et cetera, et cetera. Well, nowadays it's just a black box that does everything for you. But that time, anyway, we were trained to do that, right? And similarly using the autolith, for instance, you know, and all these techniques we had. But the question was to do that, at least even focusing on the commercially important fish species of the, of the country that time, doing that was a big challenge, mainly because it was financially prohibitive to do that. So that was not even to be considered. Then I recall clearly in 1998, fish base came to the rescue to answer part of the question. And I don't know if many of you recall this, but we had this CD-ROMs that were being dispatched called Fish Base 100, if I'm not mistaken, literally because we didn't have access to the internet at that time. But I remember we made a plea. I think it was, you had to pay for it, but I think we made a plea bit to World Fish, I can't recall where it was then, to send us that CD. And we were sent the CD. And that was transformative, folks. We were able, partly, you know, at least to some degree understand, to answer that question about the population dynamics, be it product data, et cetera, the taxonomy, the distribution, et cetera. I think it was extremely rich for us for the first time to have that sort of access to knowledge, to data, to analyze and inform policy. And using that, we formulated a team of young scientists at that time, the first of Eritrea's fisheries management and development policy. Then this step further motivated us or helped us understand or to make the case on the importance of data. And then we moved on to make the case for the government to support us in establishing the first Eritrean fisheries database system, in short called ERIFTC, which was highly complex database system that we created because the case was made by the government. If we have data, this is what we're able to do. And that is still functioning. And the lessons were shared with neighboring countries such as Somalia and Sudan as well, at that time I recall. So if this is not impact, then I don't know what it is. So every one of us here in the room who have made contribution to development, enrichment and growth of fish base, I think we should be very proud because sometimes we doubt ourselves whether our work is having any impact or not. And this is a true personal story from a young nation that was emerging in the 1990s and how fish base came to hand in order to enable us to better manage our fishery at that time. And this is something that started here as well in World Fish. So it increasingly gets more and more personal to me. This is something that started here in World Fish. Um, and um, therefore, I saw this one as a very special day for us. It's almost like in a World Fish coming home. So all of you who played a big role in bringing this uh, important uh, event to World Fish. Thank you. And at World Fish, we strongly believe in the importance of data or data-based or science-based fisheries management. And therefore, we have done an awful lot of work through the Hidden Heron Harvest, as well as PESCAS that Alex Dilley and colleagues lead 
And now we're making investment through the Resilient Aquatic Food System Initiative as well, as part of SCGIR, investing in aqua data as well, in order to promote on the utilization of data to inform fisheries management in the number of countries that we work in. Um, so with that said, um, I just want to say fish base has informed policies in a number of countries, has enabled to train people, you know, using the data as well. So therefore, I think I just want to congratulate you all who contributed, Daniel Pauli, one of the early architects of um, fish base and colleague to work with you. On behalf of all the fishery scientists across the globe, I would like to say thank you. Um, and of course, and thank you very much to all those who brought us together. Alex Tilly, Hafiz, Pauline, our communications team, and members of the Fisheries Consortium as well. Thank you for making this event happen. With that, I wish you a very successful today's event. Thank you, Alex and colleagues. Thanks very much, Hassan. Yeah, that's a really nice example. I love hearing through the years that I've worked with Fishbase in this consortium, I love hearing how it's kind of touched different people's lives. It's really fascinating to, to see how it's grown amount, uh, throughout the world and throughout the scientific community and hobbyists and actress and all this. So, uh, so uh, next up, I'd like to introduce um, Eddie Allison, who needs no introduction, but is our uh, Director of Sustainable Aquatic Foods. Thanks, Eddie. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, peers, colleagues, friends. I have the, the pleasure and honor of opening the, the scientific part of, of this important meeting, um, celebrating fish base and sea life base, um, showcasing of its contemporary applications by a number of, of users and exploring its future modalities and possibilities. I think this meeting is important for several reasons, some of which um, Esam has, um, has articulated. For those of us based at World Fish in Penang, hosting an international scientific meeting at our headquarters um, is a tangible indicator of progress through a difficult period of multiple transitions. I think this is the first time, or maybe the second time that we've been in this auditorium um, since 2019. Um, first, like millions of others around the world, we've had to transition to working remotely during the two years of uh, the height of the global COVID-19 pandemic, and then back to working in person again. Our site is not as vibrant and lively as it was before, but it's coming back to life um, after being used only by a small dedicated core of staff who maintained our research infrastructure through those two long years. Second, we're working through a transition in the organization and funding of our umbrella organization, the Consultative Group of Interna on International Agricultural Research, the CGIAR. For us at Worldfish, this has meant the end of a, a highly productive research program, um, the, the FISH uh, Consortium Research Program, which generated hundreds of research products over its four-year time span. And it's also meant um, for us the, the need to spend time and resources and energy um, to develop common administrative and managerial systems, coordinated research programs that, cost, that cross many lines previously demarcated by centers those centers were originally designed, organized by crop production, or crop systems or production systems or particular commodities. The benefits, the payoff for that, um, we hope to see in a more connected approach to food systems research. And being able to demonstrate to our other CG centers that we too have the kind of data that allows us to make decisions in the aquatic foods sector that are made in the, you know, the staple grain sector, that we have that kind of information um, is, is really important. And these databases are important for that, per, for that reason. Our 2030 um, agenda, which I hope you'll all have a chance to look at, um, 
also marks a formally stated transition from a long standing division between fisheries and aquaculture as the way that we've organized our thinking and research and our programs at, at World Fish um, towards a reformulation of research that adopts an aquatic food systems approach. And, and we've been spending a lot of time writing proposals in the last year or two to fund the implementation of this 2030 agenda. And it also is a bit of a departure for us in that it has a very strong focus on scaling technological market and policy innovations that have been developed from past research by uh, World Fish and Partners. So we're now tasked very much with demonstrating higher levels of impact and, and figuring out how to achieve um, the scaling out of some of the implications of the work that we've done. Um, we've been asked, I think, to take more responsibility for what happens once we've generated the research products. And lastly, we've also been working through a transition in our leadership at World Fish, um, a process that's incomplete, and several of us, myself and Assam included, are, are currently in interim and acting leadership positions. And, you know, hopefully that process of, of managerial transition, leadership transition, is also um, approaching um, some more stable place. A reflection on, on those, that history of um, fish base and sea life base, and a focus on what can be achieved by maintaining programs like fish base is a salutary reminder, I think, for us in, in, in a time of turbulence like this, of the need to not just respond to the short-term opportunities and crises, but to have um, the courage and the vision to, to think in the long term. It's been a lot of change for an organization to manage, and it's inevitably put pressure on our people and systems. I'm, I'm proud and somewhat in awe of what my colleagues have managed to produce over the last uh, three years, despite all these changes and instabilities. I think it's a mark of their dedication, uh, their refusal to let circumstances divert them um, from their mission to work in partnership with the world's aquatic food system actors to deliver equitable and sustainable ways to eradicate poverty and malnutrition. That remains our core mission. I think we all know that despite our challenges, um, you know, we, we are the fortunate ones. Um, the, and our work on the impacts of COVID-19 uh, on global hunger and poverty reinforces to us every day how fortunate we are and, and um, also the continuing responsibility we bear to work with um, aquatic food sector actors to um, help them find pathways through um, the, the multiple crises and, and challenging uh, trends that they face. We're also gathering just a year after Fish Base marked its 30 year anniversary and Sea Life Base its 15th. During those periods, their growth and development has been frankly staggering, um, hugely impressive. And I'll return uh, to that uh, shortly. The meeting is uh, also important for who it brings together here for the next few days. This includes the people who conceived of, gave birth to and nurtured these databases. Um, Daniel uh, Pauli, Rainier Froze, Froze and uh, Deng Palamaris and the teams of programmers and researchers who worked with them. Um, our group online and here includes um, representatives of the consortium of the 12 organizations who manage these databases, and it includes members of the database user community. So you'll be hearing from representatives of all those groups over the next two days. We're also finally very happy to uh, see here a number of distinguished former uh, ICLAM and, and Worldfish staff, um, including, and I think uh, one, of, one of them is online, uh, two former leads of our fisheries research programs um, from different eras in our history. Professor Daniel Pauli and, and Dr. Pip Cohen, um, both of whom have strongly influenced the direction and reputation of uh, the organization and the work that we do. So the databases and the research and management outcomes that their analysis, their use helps to generate, and as Sam gave an example, are the reason that we're here. Perhaps the databases need no introduction to this audience, um, although it may be helpful to say something about them, um, 
if only for those who may come across the proceedings of this meeting in future. So Fishbase is the largest and most extensively accessed online database on finfish, adult finfish, out there in the world on the web. And it attracts 700,000 visits per month. It's widely used by the research community and also by the wider public. People with range of interests in fish, from biodiversity conservationists to aquarists, hobby aquarists, recreational fishers, commercial fish farmers, and it's open access with no subscription fees or advertising. Over 2,300 contributors and collaborators upload and validate the data it contains. It's an authoritative resource, the, uh, the go-to place to find out the basic facts about the world's fish. The database provides for each of the 34,800 odd species and subspecies with a staggering 324,600 common names that have to somehow be matched with those. Um, it provides data on taxonomy, on geographical distribution, biometrics, morphology, behavior and habitats, ecology, population dynamics, as well as reproductive met metabolic and genetic data. It's an incredibly rich um, resource that can be used in multiple ways. And most recently, nutrition composition data has been added allowing the database to be used in global studies of, you know, for example, exploring diets that could deliver essential micronutrients at lower environmental costs and more equitably. The database is also linked to a range of tools such as trophic pyramids, um, taxonomic identification keys, biogeographical modeling software, and other databases, fishery statistics, IUCN Red List, um, larval fish databases, gene bank databases, allowing it to be used in a whole range of research fields informing policy management and development. And the consortium that manages it reflects some of that diversity in that it represents international organizations, the research community in, in universities and museums. Sea Life Base complements Fish Base by aiming to create and maintain an information system for all non-fish marine organisms, which makes it eventually probably more than 10 times bigger than fish base, with 400,000 plus species potentially uh, eventually being included. Again, it aims to make available the biological and ecological information necessary to, for example, conduct biodiversity surveys, uh, ecos comparative ecosystem studies, and it takes it builds on the list of species already available on paper and electronically and, and gathers them together. Um, it's a joint project of the Sea Around Us program at UBC, um, Vancouver, Canada, and uh, Quantitative Aquatics in Los Banos, Philippines. Um, and it's endorsed and monitored by the Fish Base Consortium. So the two uh, have a, a governance relationship. Again, this database is impressive. The January 2019 version and contained 66,600 plus species and its rate of growth and of data and users is similarly impressive. Together, these two databases comprise an invaluable public good to inform the governance of our aquatic food systems for healthy people and planet. I think it's useful to consider briefly the history of these databases in the spirit that an understanding of the past can help guide our future actions, as well as help us reflect on when and how to evolve and change their use and governance. Fish base, and by inference or, or extension, sea life base, were conceived of, um, if I'm correct in this by, by Daniel, um, as a means to pull together in one place difficult to find data on basic taxonomic distributional life history data on the world's fishes originally to support fisheries management in data poor fisheries. From that original function, it has evolved to become a tool that has helped, for example, to parameterize ecosystem models, to identify and resolve taxonomic uncertainties, to investigate seafood mislabeling and a whole range of other uses. So this great idea from, from a visionary champion was turned into a project worked on initially by a small dedicated group. That group was supported by and within um, an organization, well, uh, ICLAM as it was, and then eventually a small partnership 
of um, organizations. That governing group has now expanded into a consortium to manage the, the growing group of uh, collaborators and the growing size of the database. With it, the ownership and the governance of the data and the code expands and changes. The databases are still free to access, uh, they remain so, and the vision of public goods is maintained. At this meeting and after it, the consortium will debate difficult questions on how to sustain this tremendous effort, an unrivaled public resource um, for aquatic system science. We need to remember that the world in which it was conceived is different to the one in which we, we now live. The discussion on how to take um, fish base and sea life base forward has to recognize that from, the, from its birth, in, that, in what in hindsight looks like the heyday of publicly funded research, these data, databases now exist in an era of market liberalization, declining funding for public, um, public goods of various kinds and widening economic inequalities. This doesn't just present threats to the founding principles and the future of the database. It also offers some opportunities for entrepreneurial and creative thinking on how to make these tools sustainable. So these are tools with evolving histories, expanding user groups, contributors, and governors. One important discussion at this meeting will be how to evolve the practical and financial support to keep fish base and sea life base validated and independent and to ensure its continued availability, expansion, and updating. A particularly exciting evolution in these databases is the inclusion of data on nutrition and on genetics. This makes them a great importance to the future of both aquaculture and wild species genetic diversity conservation, and to discussions on pathways to a sustainable and equitable diet in the many areas of the world where aquatic species play a crucial role in nutrition and health. So to, summary, to summarize, um, global open access databases on aquatic species are important, particularly in the context that we're increasingly looking to the ocean and inland waters for some of the next major food system transitions. For example, to the many possible trajectories for the future of aquaculture, the rising interest in the multiple ecosystem service benefits of marine algae, uh, the future of capture fisheries, or the rise of laboratory and factory created substitutes for wild and farmed animals in our diets. We'll need fisheries, uh, fish base and sea life base to evaluate the biodiversity ecosystem and nutritional consequences of the technological and policy pathways um, available to us in aquatic food systems. Continuity amid, amid change is challenging, staying faithful to ideas, ideals, visions, while evolving and adapting to changing information needs economic and political circumstances, technological opportunities, changing uh, ethical codes of conduct in research is also challenging. And that's, in my view, the key uh, challenge facing the Fishbase Consortium this year is, is how to uh, continue to evolve um, these databases to make them sustainable and relevant uh, to the future while also retaining the core principles um, that led to their development. You have the best people here to meet that challenge, but I think it's going to require a combination of pragmatism and optimism about the future and perhaps taking some risks and compromises on strongly held preferences and ideals to find a path to sustain the growth and maintenance of these vital databases into a future that looks very different from the past. Most of all, I think it will require um, those of us more senior in, in, in years, myself included, um, to listen to a diversity of next generation voices, uh, those who will be tasked with clearing up you know, what we perhaps in our generation have failed and those before us have failed to do. I think if we can do that, then some of us may get to come back, the younger ones of us, uh, to celebrate 50 years of fish base. So please take the opportunity to discuss both the databases and the wi wor um, wider World Fish Research Agenda um, with the, the participants of the workshop, but also um, with my World Fish colleagues while you're here. Um, we welcome constructive critique on our current directions, and we remain committed 
to ideals that will be familiar to those who were here decades ago. The eradication of poverty and hunger, challenges to injustice, the role of scientific research in guiding policy and in developing technologies and social and governing institution to address these challenges. You'll also notice new research directions at World Fish, um, as well as an increasingly explicit commitment to a food systems approach and its links to public health. You'll see much innovation in aquaculture genetics, including the adoption of genomic methods for speeding the selective breeding for multiple desirable traits. Um, you'll also see a focus too on climate smart solutions to governance and development um, challenges um, in aquatic ecosystems due to uh, climate change. Over recent years, World Fish has committed to a gender transformative approach that goes beyond identifying and working with existing gender inequalities or trying to work around them um, to foster real change in gender relations in the aquatic food sector and to strive for equitable outcomes. And we're reflecting actively on partnerships and knowledge co-production against the background of resurgence of, for example, indigenous rights, sovereignty over food and over data, and even decolonization of agricultural research and of the wider development agenda. Please also take the opportunity to discuss with colleagues from different disciplines and generations, the similarities and differences between the approaches we've used in the past and those being used now and what they mean for how we position our work in this evolving institutional context. There are common foundations between the farming systems research pioneered at ICLAM in the 1970s and 80s and the agroecological paradigm of today, or between participatory rural appraisal and development and the transdisciplinary and co-production of knowledge approaches that we talk about today. The principles of fair access to science, expertise, data, and resources are common to our discussions on data ownership and sovereignty and to the agenda to decolonize agricultural research. From a better mutual understanding of why we do things slightly differently now, um, I hope will come more trusted respect across um, the, the timelines of many of these research endeavors. And these are the necessary conditions for durable and influential collaborative outcomes and impacts. So I wish you a successful meeting and stimulating exchanges with colleagues and an enjoyable stay in Penang. Thank you very much. Before you disappear, I wonder if anyone had any questions. I don't see any online, but I wonder if in, in the room. Ready before he descends. All right. Thanks a lot. It's great. So that gives a really, really nice introduction to uh, to Fish Base and Sea Life Base for those who perhaps don't work with it uh, regularly or, or it's the first interaction. Um, what we're going to do now is, is drill down um, into one of those specific uh, recent kind of tools that have been developed. Um, and so Sidilita Masangwi um, from Malawi is going to talk to us about fish nutrients and the interaction with fish base. So the talks, uh, just to remind our, you have about 20 minutes, including questions. There's a clock at the back. And, uh, and then I'll just let you know if you're talking too long. Good morning, everyone. And also to recognize our online audience, good morning. Good afternoon and good evening. My name is Sidrita Masangui, and as Alex mentioned, I'm coming from Malawi, from the Lilongwe University of Agriculture and Natural Resources. I'm a nutritionist and a food scientist, and I was trained by the University of Malawi, Bunda College. Currently, I'm also pursuing a Master of Science in Human Nutrition at the Lilongwe University of Agriculture and Natural Resources which is currently the best agricultural university in Malawi. My work has been mostly concerned with food composition data. And for six years, 
I worked with the Lilongwe Investor of Agriculture and Natural Resources, South African Medical Research Council's SAFUD, and Tufts University to develop Malawi's first food composition tables, which was published in 2019. I have worked with FAO to develop a global food composition database, which is yet to be published. And currently also joined the University of Lancaster to collect, review, and compile the newest analytical data on fish, which is the work that I'll be presenting today. Data innovations increase knowledge on nutritional values of fish. So let me kickstart the day with a talk about a new data innovation and one that involves fish in food systems. This is really about conversations and actions that seek, seeks to go beyond looking at fish in the, in, the, in the food systems through the lens of production, through the lens of fish as an important source of uh, protein, and as well, what may be considered as a pessimistic trajectory of aquaculture and fisheries, especially when it comes to its role in the fight against malnutrition. So we may wonder why it matters and where does it all fit? Well, remember, we are still in the decade of action on nutrition, which is now at a nexus with the United Nations decade of ocean science for sustainable development. And interestingly enough, this year is also named the International Year of Atsano Fisheries, which makes it only an appropriate timing for us to recognize and highlight the role that fish plays in food and nutritional security globally. So fish for nutrition. What we know now is that all fish are not made nutritionally equal. And that, what that means is that the different species can be higher or lower in different nutrients. For example, iron can be up to 200 times variation amongst the species. And calcium can go even higher to vary up to 600 times. So what is the role of fish in nutrition, in diet, for health? And why do the different nutritional qualities amongst fish species matter? Well, you may agree with me that fish are not really about kilocalories or kilojoules. So as an energy source to fight hunger, fish should not be your go-to food type. But most often you hear people or maybe a fisheries document present fish as an important source of protein. I would like to argue that it is the micronutrients that fish contains, so the, the minerals, essential fatty acids, and vitamins, and not the fact that they are indeed a good source of protein, that makes them an incredibly variable tool for addressing malnutrition, and in particularly micronutrient malnutrition. And yet, there are very large gaps in data on the nutrition composition of fish. Add on top of that, these data are exceptionally difficult and expensive to collect. So the reliable, accessible, and up-to-date data from databases that do exist have been currently lacking, with most of the known food species to be consumed not having their nutritional profiles documented. Well, hold on, because I've got some good news. Through this collaboration, which I'm very proud and lucky to be a part of, we have a new tool, Fish Nutrients, which now solves part of the problem. So starting from 2015 and continuing adding on new collaborators until now, a group of researchers across organizations and across disciplines from data modeling, database management, nutritionists, and fisheries scientists have been working together to address the data gaps that I mentioned. These partners include the University of Lancaster, FAO, and of course, World Fish and Fish Base. 
So these researchers have compiled what is now called fish nutrients, a database that contains empirical and predictive values of seven nutritional components of various fish species. So just to touch a little bit on how we came up with this database. First, uh, data curation began with some data being drawn from the well-established database of FAO inputs, which is a database that is curated by nutritional experts at FAO. Secondly, data was also collected from published studies of fish from the literature, uh, particularly the web of science. And then experts were also consulted in order to have access to other sources of reliable but harder to find nutrition of fish analytical data. Later on, this information that was compiled was then uh, used together with information that is available from fish base in order to enable that data to be modeled for prediction of nutrient values of species whose data was not available. So during the data, uh, the stages of data curation have really evolved over time. From starting from 2015 to, to 2019, where we had a compilation of about 250 plus species, and that was marine species only. And the predictive model was run and uh, published. In 2020, we went further to add freshwater species. And again, the predictive model was relearned. In 2021, this is now where we had about empirical values of about 500 for both marine and freshwater species. And through the modeling, we had produced about 500 plus species. And this is the new function that is now available on fish base. We have not stopped there because this year now, we continue to add newly published information that is available to update the fish sprint. And then very soon, we'll also, uh, the model will also be relearned uh, based on the new data that has been added. And what, what is interesting is that through this new data, we will also plan to add it back to FAO Infoods database, which is the database that all nutritionists tend to. So just to zoom in on the work that has been done this year, what we have done is that we have included an additional database of which to source data from, which is Scopus. Updating this empirical data to include newly published data on new species would improve the accuracy of the predictability of the model for fish nutrient estimates across species. So this time we added Scopus, and I'm happy to announce that we have updated the fish data sprint to include high quality analytical data published between 2016 and 2022. Together, we have over 800 new data points, and we have also added 300 plus new species of fish, of which 184 were previously not reported. The data is already being refined and modeled by our expert, our expert Aaron McNeil, to come up with new values based on the updated sprint. Furthermore, as Elia mentioned, we also plan to facilitate the flow of data back into the InFoods database. So just an example, this is the function that, is, uh, that was launched in June of 2021, where now you can be able to access uh, nutrient information of fish together with all the other information on fish bays. Now, everyone who is interested can access the nutrient profiles together with the environmental and ecological information available on fish bays. Just to touch on the basics of the predictive model that was used to come up with the predictive estimates of the nutrient composition of the species, this team 
of research has discovered that in the absence of raw data, it is possible to build on existing data to predict nutrient content of other species. Because it is well known that species nutrient content varies based on its diet, energetic demand and thermal regime, a Bayesian hierarchical predictive model of nutrient concentrations related to 20 ecological variables of diet, thermal regime and energetic demand was developed. That is of course controlling for sampling method, habitant and phylogeny. This statistical model, as I have earlier mentioned, was a success in that it was able to accurately predict the nutrient profiles of every species of fish, both marine and freshwater. For the first time and for every species of fish, we have the essential minerals, omega-3 fatty acids, vitamin A, and protein concentrations of fish obtained on fish base, where the data was incorporated alongside the primary data. This is really the innovative tool that fish nutrients is. So during this data sprint, a collaborator, James Robinson from the University of Lancaster, has also developed a novel world to explore fish nutrients data, both the empirical and predicted values. So whilst the full data sets were, were downloadable via our fish base, this new application makes exploring data on the web very easy, engaging, and free. For example, you can see now that it includes the nutrient concentrations in comparison with the targeted population and their recommended intakes, as well as portion sizes. We are currently finalizing ways in, in, in order to be able to embed this or somehow link it back to fish base. So is it just about data or we really now have analytical power and insights. Well, since its launch, Fish Nutrients Database has already demonstrated its power to answer critical research questions when the data is being used. Recent analysis and publications illustrate the power of nutrient composition databases, particularly when combined with other data on fisheries, trade, ecological and economic attributes of species. For example, uh, you can see on this slide some of the publications that have already been made and some which are underway. The analysis have generated new insights on which to govern fisheries, fish food systems, and entire food systems in ways that optimizes nutritional gains, particularly in context and among sectors of society that are most vulnerable to nutrient deficiencies. However, we recognize the need to continue to expand it so that we take into consideration the huge diversity of aquatic foods, animals, and plants around the world. And I believe this is the part of the collaboration work that uh, Deng will also share more on. Thank you very much to our collaborating partners and to you all for listening. Thank you. Um, questions in the room? Let's check. Right. Um, Jessica, you can just use the microphone next to you. delighted to be here in Penang. First of all, thank you for a very interesting talk. It's clearly super important to understand the nutri nutritional variability of all these species. And when you think about aquaculture, there's a small subset of species that we tend to farm. Where do they sit on the nutritional spectrum? Good, bad, or just convenient? Oh, sorry, can you come again on the last part? Okay, so when we think about the fish that we choose to farm, like Atlantic salmon, um, kingfish, and so on, tilapia, where do they sit on the nutrient 
spectrum? Are we choosing the right species to farm or are they the, are they the McDonald's of the sea? Thank you. Well, that is a very good question to ask because what we, when we have the nutrition composition of the various species, that's when we can be able to tell whether we are choosing the best and also to know whether there's more we can explore. And that is really the important of having the nutrient profiles of all the species so that now we can be able to uh, analyze and see which ones uh, would even help us better when it comes to nutrition. Thing. Yes, please. Guys, glad to meet you. Um, you in, in the original version of the Fishing Village tool, there are only seven. I <laughs> Um, in the original version of this fish nutrients tool, there were only seven nutrients, but now I see that you have included B12. Are we going to also include that in fish base? Uh, so no, currently what will be added back into fish base is still the seven nutrients. Yeah. is one of those nutrients that's important to measure. And that's why I was, I was looking at this um, presentation with, uh, with great interest, because if we included B12 and omega-3, calcium yeah, uh, did for that kind of stuff. It's just yeah. Like, yeah, I think that that is uh, something of a conversation that um, we, we, can, we can take because we realize that there is more of the nutrients that we need and more that can actually be added. So um, speaking with hope, in future, we should be able to add more uh, nutrients. Thank you. I don't need to introduce the next guest because the, uh, the next speaker, because it's me. All right. Great. So, so Tilita gave a, a, an incredible um, introduction to my own talk because I've been one of uh, the people working to kind of leverage this amazing work that's been done on fish nutrients. Um, and to try and uh, apply it in a practical sense of nutrition sensitive fisheries management. So I work um, quite a bit in East Timor, Timor Leste. Uh, and as mentioned by Esam earlier this morning, we've been working on a system called PESCAS, which is a digital catch monitoring system uh, that tracks boats and combines that with catches and, and makes it into a near real time um, system. So I wanted to see if it was possible to actually try out um, the fish nutrients models developed by Aaron McNeil and, and, and the team um, in this situation. Uh, just to acknowledge uh, co-authors, Lorenzo Longobardi is the data scientist who, who put all this together and, and um, created PESCAS, the, the back end. Um, and Gianna Bonas Profumo is a, is a postdoc working with us in Timor um, and is a nutrition expert. And then there's lots of, uh, lots of people that are on the ground doing the, the boots in the mud work um, that is crucial, like Joktan, Dostres, Lopez, um, and others. So I won't go uh, deeply into, because Satilta has given us a good introduction of... Um, of the nutrients that, that fish can potentially provide, the micronutrients. But the, the problem in general is that we're still seeing declines in, in diet diversity, in diet quality, and uh, nutrition in general. So 
since 2010, there's actually been, you know, a 15% decline. So it's still something we need to actively work on. Um, as we know, food is also getting more expensive. Um, there's more pressure on food systems. So how do we more efficiently use food in a, in a nutrition sense, as opposed to just thinking about production and yield and making the most amount possible? Um, and what you, you tend to see when you work in these systems is that, that undernourishment or malnutrition obviously intersect heavily with poverty. And so even if we can produce the food, it's, it's working on things like access to it and making it affordable that are the real challenges. Timor is one of the most malnourished nations in the world. It, it usually features at least in the kind of uh, the bottom 10. Um, I think it was third when they third to bottom when they last did the assessment. And there are there is instances of most malnutrition um, uh, cases of malnutrition. So but stunting is the big one. So about half of the, the children in uh, Timor are, are stunted, which means like low height for age. And they do this, they know, you know, it's not just, well, people say, oh, aren't Timorese people just short genetically? But you can actually study this comparing with populations of Timorese that are not in Timor and are fed on different diets and, and things. So that's the way they, they know. Um, it's at the eastern end of the Ar uh, Indonesian archipelago. Um, it's a kind of half island nation, uh, became independent in uh, 1999. And, and so they are, they are really trying to focus, they rely heavily on oil at the moment and a sovereign wealth fund, but really need to start transitioning. That looks like it's depleting and they need to start transitioning more into agriculture. So this is very, very sort of pertinent work. And as you tend to see in poor um, countries and, and situations is that the diets are very energy dense. Uh, they're not particularly diverse. People want to feel full and have the energy to do things, but they're not uh, particularly diverse in terms of fruits and vegetables and, and pulses and whatnot. So uh, speaking with, with friends of mine in Timor, they say, no, a, a meal has to have like a full plate of rice and then you add other things. But the rice is hugely important. If you don't have that, you don't feel full. It's not a real meal. Um, and so the, the potential of, of the fish nutrients tool and, and pescas the, is that if we can, if we can um, look at catches, and this is the work, you know, pioneered by Christina Hicks and others at Lancaster and um, through the, the paper that came out, is that if we can look at catches in terms of their nutrient contribution, we can actually change the way that those fish are used and, and prioritized in um, situations of, of malnutrition. This is also not so much in Timor, but in other countries, particularly prevalent in if much of the fisheries catch is just exported, because you may have really poor nutrition in country, and then countries are just shipping it, selling it all to, uh, to other, other countries in Europe, the US, China, and actually those nutrients could be really well used in, in situ. So I won't dwell too much on this. Sitilita was already gave us um, a, an intro, but basically thinking about fish not as not as all the same. A fish is not a fish, so to speak, and they, they do have different uh, based on their ecology, where they live, um, the depth, the uh, latitude, longitude, um, their diets will depend what what nutrients are uh, are available or bioavailable to the next consumer. And then we have the PESCA system, which I mentioned. So this was, this started in about 2017 when I was living in Timor. There was very, very little fisheries information available. The similar situation that Essam mentioned in Eritrea. We knew nothing about, um, uh, during Indonesian occupation, they managed fisheries quite, you know, quite thoroughly, but then, Post-independence, the fishery became uh, very much like what you see in the 
in the previous slide, these uh, it, it's dug out canoes and it's very near shore and it's very reef focused fisheries. Um, and we really didn't know anything about them. What are they catching? Where is it going? Who's eating it? And it, it seems that it's very, very coastal dominated. So coastal areas have a um, similar fish consumption to, um, to elsewhere in the world, not as high as neighboring countries like Indonesia and the Pacific Islands, but still at a kind of 17 um, uh, kilos per, per person per year. Um, whereas in the rural areas, so Timor is quite a young um, island and it's very steep. And so you get the kind of what they call Foho, the, the, the mountainous areas in the center of the country. And those are really isolated, don't have access to, to fish. And so consume very little. And so the, we wanted to be able to know um, what is being produced, what's being caught and by whom and where. And so we decided, well, let's get data collectors into the field with tablets. They can be collecting from fishers when they come on shore, what's, uh, what's being caught. Um, and this was done in, in collaboration with the government. Um, and, and this has seen a really nice impact, a real nice kind of um, uh, evolution in Timor where now the government have adopted the system and they are now paying for it. And so this is one of those rare cases where you know, some research and some intervention and some practical application like results in something being taken forward uh, or scaled, so to speak. Just to, to quickly mention how this interacts with fish base. Um, the flow is that in the center there through GitHub, um, Lorenzo has, has coded it so that it pulls um, length weight uh, relationships from fish base. So we don't actually weigh any fish in Timor. We collect lengths in groups, and then based on the species that they are, then they are converted into, uh, into weight. Um, and then it pulls in other, uh, other uh, the fish nutrients models from the team previously mentioned. And so that now we are able to actually model the, the, the nutrient contribution from um, Timor catches. So this is what the dashboard looks like. You, it's open access is publicly available online. So by all means, have a look. Uh, the address is at the bottom right there. And, and so we, we have a kind of dynamic map. It shows catch and effort where the things are coming from. It shows the, the time series over, over um, the past four years. And now what we can do is, is we can look at, right, well, what's the recommended daily intake of these nutrients? And to what extent are the catches in Timor contributing to that? So selenium is, is one that is found in very high concentrations in, in a lot of fish species. So this one's kind of off the charts. But you see the orange vertical lines on these bars for selenium protein omega-3. Um, you can see that actually, even at the relatively low production of Timor from dugout canoes and a few motorboats and things, actually um, it's exceeding the recommended daily intake for, um, for the the coastal populations there. So it it there is the potential if we can manage the the availability and the distribution of these species more effectively, there is that potential. But the problem is how do we actually do that in a practical sense? Um, this one just shows by kind of species groups. So the, the way that we manage it, sorry, it's a bit small, um, but at the top you've got sardines and pilchards. The, the big one in the third uh, from the top is mackerel scad. So these kind of small pelagics. Um, very high in nutrients. Um, and so we pick the, the locally very important targeted species and we keep them as species. And then the, the groups that are more rarely caught or not all that prevalent, we, we kind of group them by, by class or um, genus. And then you can actually look at it also by the, the fishing ground or the habitat. And so this is where you can start kind of thinking, how do we change the, 
the way that they catch fish to kind of perhaps still in a sustainable way, but target those that are very high nu nutrients and can, and can be prioritized for, for that kind of application. And so we, we've been working over the past few years in, in Timor with FAD, so fish aggregating devices. It's basically like, I like to call it a fish disco. So you basically put um, a, a moored anchored line in relatively near shore waters with some kind of uh, um, leaves or strapping or netting coming off it and the fish gather around it um, and can be more easily targeted by rudimentary gears like dugout canoes and, and gill nets and things like that. So what we can see is that in, in um, the nutritional composition of catches caught around fads is very high because obviously you're getting a lot of these small pelagics around. So um, the so the question comes back to okay so we if we if we want to manage it in this way we need to raise the the availability of these fish so fads are a potential um, method of doing that. And then we also need to raise the demand for those from inshore, like mountainous areas where perhaps they're not aware of the, the benefits of including fish as part of a diverse diet. So this is what a fad looks like. Um, on the right, you've, you've got kind of a picture under the water of, of kind of that um, uh, complex structure that I mentioned. So it might be netting or it might be palm fronds. Um, and then from above the water, you see on the left, often there's like a raft floating above it. And so we, we did some work. You can see the, the paper there uh, from 2019 that shows that the, the catch rates are higher around fads and that they can you know, be a potential way for um, catch to be more targeted towards um, small pelagics. And in that way, also take pressure off relatively fragile reef systems as well. And then to, to increase demand, um, it's more of kind of a behavior change problem. And so we started to work uh, in a project that is just coming to an end now. Um, I designed this uh, randomized control trial where we, we had some communities that had access to fish from fads and some that had um, social and behavior change communication around eating more fish and how to prepare certain things um, in, the, in the mountainous areas. And so the methods paper for that is out already and we're just analyzing the final data now. So it's a way of, of seeing, well, does this work? If we tell people about fish and teach them how to cook it and prepare it, does that increase the demand and, and is it having an effect on diets um, in, in upland areas. So in conclusion, it, it's a complex thing in changing. I mean, really we're changing the way that fisheries have been managed or the, the perception of fisheries over the past well, 50 years plus, uh, 70 years probably, um, uh, in, in thinking not around kind of the maximum sustainable yield, but as James Robinson in a recent paper did, is, is sort of maximum nutrient yield. How do we manage this sustainably? How do we actually practically target that in, in different areas of need? Um, and it comes down to driving fish inland, basically, towards those most needy uh, communities. So this is really just a work in progress. I just wanted to show you what we're up to. Um, and and the, the fish base and the fish nutrients tool are, are fantastic. And we've sort of taken it up and, and tried to pair it with Pescus. And so this is really just a kind of case study of how this might work in the, uh, in the long term. Um, thanks, I'll take any questions. And I, and I wanted to just point out that you can have a look at uh, pescus.org is the, is the site where you can see that dashboard and you can see all the nutrient modeling and things. And if you have any, insights or would like to collaborate or like to use it in some way, then uh, I, I'd really welcome that. So do, do shoot me an email or, or what have you or come and chat. Thanks very much. I'll put that one up there just so. Did anyone have any questions? for me before uh, the next talk. Yes, Deng, please.
<laughs> so take a step down as well then 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 you'll be closer to it i just want to say that if this this presentation and the the, the tool and the data makes everything whole and that's really nice to see where the tool and the data goes to um i did have one concern was the use of bags and growth overfishing or the potential for growth of overfishing is there uh, sort of like uh, are you looking at that um, and trying to prevent that certainly it is a it is a major concern i mean there's a lot of contention around fads mostly um, offshore and drifting fads and and aggregating high value tuna um, in this more kind of livelihood case, they're, they're near shore anchored fads. And absolutely, it's a concern. I mean, we, we still need to monitor those populations of small pelagics to make sure that the, the increased targeting is not um, uh, stressing those populations more than necessary. It's not currently part of, I mean, the stock assessment of those stocks is not currently part of my, um, my projects, but it, it is um within that broader or to know that it's sustainable exploitation and it's uh as i mentioned some of the work by james robinson around this kind of looking at vulnerability of different species and the maximum nutritional yield um so the the field is growing and i think it's just a a good opportunity using some of these tools and then building more of a kind of community of practice around how we do this um, effectively. But, but it is a major concern. And, and whenever anyone hears the fad term, there's a bit of a shock usually because they do have a bad name. But more in this sense, it's, it's quite um, small scale. And it, it's more about making um, different fisheries resources within access of existing gear types. So we're not, uh, you know, we're not deploying these uh, digitally controlled, you know, offshore fads that for high value species, it's really um, uh, making them accessible to people in small boats and with, with very limited investment in their own um, fishing gears and whatnot. Yes, Sam. I'm about to get told off now. Working good. I think Alex did very good with the exemplification. Of course, I want to recognize the previous presenter as well. Just wanted to say, I guess um, this is a question not necessarily for you only, um, Alex, but for all of us. A reminder to myself and everyone else, maybe to reflect on over the next couple of days. I think this is fascinating stuff, right? The data, particularly the Pesca story, is really uplifting the story. How something that starts as a project can is eventually owned and utilized by the government. I think that's really fantastic. I guess as we explore now with all the different sources of data that we have, how are governments got very um, highest level of authority to make a difference either through fiscal allocations or other tools that they may have how are they utilizing the data um, and uh, to utilize that in informing the yeah, decision-making process, right? In the end of the day, I think the best case scenario that we want to see is when these data sets are made available to one of the users, governments, who have the authority over the resources to govern them, to manage them, and how are they utilizing the data in order to bring about that desirable change from a sustainability point of view, from a nutritional benefit point of view, from other social, economic, and cultural benefits that need to be delivered to those who need it most. So I just want to hear if there is any example of how that has helped government 
to formulate or reform existing policies. But again, this is not just for this session, but I think over the next couple of days, I think it would be really good to complete that story in terms of you know, how is this changing our practice. Thank you. Great. Yeah, we have actually, I mean, specifically about Timor, we have just completed an impact assessment of Pescas, and that was really enlightening because it's, it, we're still at, in early days, so it's, we haven't seen the data specifically being used to change policies around, uh, let's say, fishing practices or the way, but what we have seen is that it, the system has generated a lot more interest in the sector and investment by both the government um, directly, but also in others wanting to, to use similar systems. And we were approached by, um, I can't remember the name of the, the ministry, but around um, uh, information and communication technologies ministry or what have you, and said, this is a great case that we need to, to bring across the board. But you're absolutely right. I mean, it's how do we how do we click past, you know, just generating more and more data and actually say, well, how do we make this uh, implementable or how do we break this down so that the decision makers can understand what is what it's actually showing? And that's often the often the biggest challenge is that kind of digital divide as well. It's like, how do we raise the capacity to use the information? I think that this has probably been a challenge that uh, Fishbase has been struggling with for 30 years is there's all this information and it's incredibly rich but how do we actually get the data that are needed into the hands of the decision makers that so yeah i um i obviously don't have an answer but i i think it's a very pertinent question uh, to keep in mind throughout this kind of proceedings yes neil Very encouraging, too, in terms of the point that Assam has just raised about influencing government directions. Uh, I was also interested in if you would just expand a little bit on how you trans or how you connected with the inland communities and how you feel that influencing people about changes in preferences and changes in food practice went and how to do that sure uh thanks for the question yeah it's a good one it, it so the for this um study we worked with a partner mercy corps um who had previously set up kind of um village savings and loans associations uh, within the communities and so we kind of leveraged that existing network um, throughout the country. Um, we worked in 24 different uh, villages. And so it worked out to be about 720 households that we kind of surveyed as part of a part of this. Some obviously were uh, received the, the behavior change communication, some didn't. And, um, and so using those uh, associations was a good way of and some had to be set up specifically for the, the study. Um, but that was a good way of interacting because they had already received some sort of uh, training and capacity around savings and were receptive to information. You know, they were to some extent already champions within that sort of uh, community. Um, and I think the biggest challenge is not specifically what you asked, but the biggest challenge of is really connecting the upland communities with the coastal areas. And it was like, well, how do we how do we know that the the fish are actually going to make it to these areas? Because we didn't pay distributors or anything. We didn't force fish to go up to these, you know, up to these areas. It was really trying to um, increase the demand so that then those establish naturally because the problem that we saw was that we didn't have funding or or interest to kind of continually 
um, subsidize the fish from the coast going up to communities because that's not really a natural system and economics will you know take effect sooner or later so we wanted to try and grow those networks almost um, organically if you will and so we worked with some um, traders who were already to some extent traveling within those communities um, albeit somewhat infrequently and and said will you be going to these places and then we kind of narrowed down on the communities we wanted to work with because they were already to some extent part of those distribution networks um, so it was a bit of um, you know back and forth in trying to see what might be functional because you I mean you could pick a place in the middle of nowhere in the and and really the access problem was so insurmountable that you you wouldn't probably have seen any change but we wanted to kind of test both angles of supply and demand i hope that goes some way to answering your question um we can definitely chat later about it all right i will uh call my talk to a close and invite the the next speaker um who is uh standing in for dr das uh, dr bahira comes to us from calcutta thank you so much for making the trip over um uh, the other presenter couldn't make it. He had a family emergency late on. Um, thanks so much. Uh, presenting on small-scale fisheries of the River Ganga. Very good morning to all of you. Uh, I'm really thankful uh, to Dr. Esan. Uh, DG Wolfies and also Dr. Alex for giving this opportunity to present uh, some of our work. Uh, basically, uh, I hail from Indian Council of Agricultural Research. And under that umbrella, we have got an institute called Central Inland Fisheries Research Institute, which is located at Kolkata in India. We have got a few collaborations with all uh, Wolfies especially to work in small scale fisheries in West Bengal and Assam, two states in India, to develop the wetland fisheries through a small scale fisheries approach. Uh, but at the same time, we have got uh, subsequent funding from government of India under clean Ganga. Ganga is a major riverine ecosystem in India. And due to pollution and other problems, uh, the fisheries biodiversity is declining day by day. So government of India is now planning to have a clean Ganga mission program under which our institute is looking for the fish biodiversity conservation and how to maintain the sustainable management of fisheries in the river Ganga. Under that project, we have worked on nutrient profiling of few indigenous fishes of river Ganga. That work my director, Dr. B.K. Das, supposed to present, so I am presenting on behalf of him. Uh, as you know that uh, Alex has already told regarding the malnutrition and other problems. So if you'll see, now one in every three children in the world are facing hidden hunger, especially the micronutrient deficiencies. So mostly the uh, problem of hidden hunger, another is caloric hunger, and another is protein hunger. These are the three dimension of hidden hunger. So now we, how we have to tackle all these uh, situations. So in that national mission on clean Ganga, we have got three, four major components where we are looking for that enrichment of the depleted fish stocks through captive breeding and indigenous uh, stocks and a ranching program, recruitment of new individuals in that river Ganga. And these are the few objectives that how to restore the fisheries biodiversity, especially like Indian machacaves in the river Ganga and hill fisheries, and at the same time, we are also looking for how to conserve the dolphins in the river Ganga under this project. If we'll, small, if we'll see the small scale fisheries in relation to Ganga fisheries, 
this sector contributes to immense amount of food, then poverty elevation, trade, secure livelihood, and also provide nutrition. So these are the activities what we are working on under this project. Uh, but what are the problems in small fisheries facing in the river Ganga? Mainly due to lack of proper management, less of accessibility to modern technologies, capital at the same time marketing channel, electricity, education, and manpower. These are the issues we are facing for the small scale fisheries. If we'll see, and uh, during our study also, we are studying what are the top different types of crafts, gears, uh, people are using nearly 82 different types of fishing gears. Our fishermen are using and at the, out of that around 26 type of gill nets. Because of those use of these nets, indiscriminate catching of all the fishes are being done. So that's why there is a lot of loss in fish biodiversity. Around 26 different types of baits are used for line fishing and seven categories are recorded for line fishing also. So similarly, if you'll see the different type of crafts also being used for fishing, uh, for which the biodiversity is going to loss day by day. And if you'll see the status of nutritional deficiency in Indian population, uh, a lot of uh, problems for the uh, children. So if you'll see, uh, see the globally, 36 countries were reported from 90% of total stunted children and about 159 million stunted children of them, 74 million were reported from Southeast Asia itself. So the fisheries and nutrition, NutriSmart Fisheries has got a tremendous role to tackle this situation in Southeast Asia. Then if you'll see the role of fish in human nutrition, fish is an important uh, uh, component as a diet where around every fish contains around 15 to 20 percent of protein and it contains a lot of essential micronutrients and at the same time if you will see the omega-3 omega C, especially EPA and DHA many of the fishes are rich in all these two uh, fatty acids and if sm especially small indigenous fishes are nutrient uh, dense rich in micronutrients so those things are very much useful for human health then uh, what is the role of small scale fisheries and nutritional benefits? We have identified around 31 indigenous fish species, which has got tremendous uh, nutritional value for human health under this project. This is what this, uh, our sampling sites in the river Ganga, different parts in the West Bengal. And if you'll see, these are the some data I am presenting here, because uh, actually uh, I came to know from City Thala that there is a fish base now have gone for documenting the nutrition database along with other fish biology database and their length, weight, and other morphological characters, all the database along with that. So now, what a, seven, eight years back, we have started working on nutrient profiling of Indian fish species. Around 100 fish species, we have documented their fatty acid profiling, amino acid profiles, their approximate compositions, mineral, com everything we have documented. And in our institute website, we have got a nutri fish in, there is a website where you can get all the data. So we are continuously also working on generating these information. So what I think our institute can also be a partner to this fish based, based nutrition database by which we can supplement our information from Indian uh, context. This is what regarding moisture content and crude protein, crude protein, crude fat and as of all these fish species. If uh, we have already documented and we have published and we are also going on publishing this data. Amino acid rich species, so what are the different uh, fish species having what kind of different 20 amino, uh, essential amino acids we have uh, documented. So if you'll see, though we have also identified certain fishes which are rich in methionine, histidine, means specifically which kind of essential amino acids is rich in which fish, that also we have documented. If you'll see around 70 to 100 gram of small indigenous species, can fulfill the requirement of 85 to 100% of the amino acid requirement of the human. So we have documented in that way, but how these data can as our uh, DG uh, was telling, how the intergovernmental agencies can look for, they develop the dietary guideline for the uh, human. So next, next if we'll see, then uh, oil rich, we have identified fishes having less than 2% fat, 
within the two to four percent fat, medium fat fish like four to eight percent, and similarly are greater than eight percent fat fishes. So this fish, uh, document is also is with us. If we'll see anadont of stoma chakunda and gonilasa minmana, then we have omega three and omega six fatty acids rich in these two uh, fishes. So if you'll see similarly, mineral rich that all calcium, copper, iron, potassium, magnesium, all these things have been documented in different type of fishes, what are their quantities and all that. So these, if you'll see 80 to 100 gram of small indigenous fishes can fulfill the requirement of minerals like calcium, copper, iron, potassium, manganese and other uh, micronutrients. So each and every individual fish species having which kind of uh, micronutrient is rich, that information we have got. So those information, how we can integrate with our fish-based database that we can later on discuss and we can collaborate. If you'll similarly, if you'll see the protein-rich fishes also, which kind of fishes are highly rich in protein, that information also we have documented. Similarly, we have identified five nutrient-dense fish species among the studied fishes. These are like, you know, Microbacterium alcumsoni, Anandontastoma chakunda, then Cardio uh, murara, all these fish species are very rich in protein, also micronutrient, vitamin, other things. So if you'll see under this mission for nutrifish in what we are pursuing in our institute, mostly we are developing the database on the nutritional, uh, uh, pro nutritional um, profile of all these Indian fish species. And we have developed the, same, uh, the website where we have kept all this information. So those information can be linked to our world fish, the uh, fish base. So these are the few publications uh, we have published out of our research work. And in con conclusion, I want to highlight that uh, we have got a lot of uh, information regarding to these uh, nutritional aspects of fishes. Uh, Madam Sakuntala also visited our institute twice, twice or thrice. She knows some of our activities also. So we have got already collaboration under Window 3 program for small scale fisheries with wild fish. So definitely we are going to partnering in uh, sharing our information to the fish base by which we can enrich the, the fish, Indian fisheries database and fish base. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Vaheda. Is this working? I think it is. Hello. Do we have any questions for Dr. Vaheda? I have one to kick us off. Just um, I was curious, you, you showed the different fat contents according to the fish. What, how does that vary? What's the range uh, in terms of condition factor? Like of the of the fish, does that affect quite a bit the the fat content? Yes, uh, as from your slides also I have seen, but based on different uh, habitats, a uh, different season. Even Hilsa, we have studied in different season, they have got different type of uh, fatty acid profile. In uh, rainy season, in winter season, in summer season, and also we have published one paper, then in different size groups also in Hilsa, in different size, group, medium size group, small size group, larger size group, more than two kilo size group. So like the different size group, different season, different sites has got different types of fatty acid profiles. So those, that's what, you know, before seven, eight years before when we started, even Indian major calves, there was not a single information on nutrition was not available. We started working on that. So you know, thousands of fish samples, fish species, and different habitats, cold water, hot water, then uh, brackish water, uh, fresh water. So in different uh, climatic conditions, different geographical locations, different season, different sites, different size groups. If you'll have for one, one species, then it will be huge data. So I was listening from the morning, then everybody, you see, once you'll start something, then everybody will ask, oh, why not today? It will take some time. So earlier nobody was doing. So now we have started. At least we have started. We have generated a lot of data. So if slowly, slowly, what we are thinking, uh, those size specific, then season specific, location specific, for individual species should also be recorded. 
and uh, recently uh, we have we have uh, sent a paper even though there you will change feeding pattern there is a change of uh, uh, profiles so in one especially kuntia uh, sarna that is not that's not basically a fatty fish but we have started giving the feed supplemented with omega 3 and uh, omega 6 and we found after that we did uh, gcms analysis from the control and treated then we found the control is not having not at all little bit of omega 3 but uh, this uh, uh, treated one is having omega 3 and omega 6 though there is no need of genome engineering even though if you go for feeding properly along with some supplementation of uh, omega 3 we can change the uh, fatty acid profile also not only fatty acid profile, you can change the mineral pattern, we can change the other, other micronutrient requirements and also vitamins through feeding schedule also. So those things has to be studied and documented, but really it's a good thing that uh, we have started. So now it is important to partner and share our information. That's what where some lacking is going on, I, I hope. So that bridge gap, bridge gap is needed. Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, I, I agree. Collaborations are, are needed. So hopefully those discussions happen while you're here. Uh, any any other questions? Yes, Jessica. Uh, thank you for a very interesting uh, presentation. At one point, you mentioned that you were looking at endemic species to the Ganga, as opposed to, I think, species that are more widely distributed. Is that correct? Yeah. So do you think that um, endemic species are more nutritionally valuable than the more broadly distributed species? Like, should we be focusing on those for nutrient security or does that not matter? No, because under, we have got a, madam, we have got a project on uh, clean, clean Ganga mission mode project. Under that, whatever the fishes we have collected, we basically we have given this to study the fish biodiversity of river Ganga. Under that, whatever the fishes we have collected, we have gone for the nutrient profiling of all those fishes. We have not compared with other uh, ecosystems and all that. Whatever the fish species we have got from river Ganga, we have gone for the proximate composition, fatty acid profiling, amino acid profiling, and also mineral profiling. Those data I have presented here. Thank you. Uh, yes, the question. Yeah, uh, sorry, maybe a bit, it's a question about um, maybe out of topic, but I was thinking of like, have you ever working on like any pollutants like inside the fish? Like, like a little bit louder. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yeah. So, I mean, um, so apart from the nutrient that you're working on, since you do GCMS or maybe, maybe HPLC, have you ever worked on um, any pollutant inside the fish? Since we know, like Ganga is uh, one of the most polluted river in the in the world. So, have you ever worked on the nutrient? Oh, sorry, work on the pollutant data in the inside the fish. Hilsa. Well, exactly, I, I could not. Get. I think the I mean, question is, uh, have you worked on pollutants? Okay. Uh, so yes, uh, the, we have worked on the pollution levels, especially heavy metal. Uh, bioaccumulation in fish and also pesticide bioaccumulation in fish. We have studied it. And uh, a few, you see, Ganga is a very big river. So thousands of kilometers uh, length. Then different stretches have got different types of industries, cities. Somewhere city sewages are coming, somewhere industrial effluents are coming. Based on their uh, discharge, somewhere hospitals discharges are coming from city. So uh, different places has got different type of pollutants. And some stretches are there very pristine. Uh, there is no pollution at all. So we have studied different stretches taking the different fishes from different stretches. And somewhere we found some pollutants are below detection limit, somewhere also beyond the harmful limit. So we have got, we have recorded all these things. And still, because it's a continuous work, we are still doing this type of studies. We have got a division of environmental biotechnology. Under that division, we are working on that. 
Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I'm excited to say it is coffee break. Um, and so uh, coffee will be just outside uh, the door here. And you're welcome to kind of mingle into the lobby as well, if you like. Uh, if you can come back for 11.15, so in half an hour, uh, for some um, a dive into some data approaches, um, starting off. Thanks very much. Hello, hello. Welcome back, everyone. I hope you enjoyed your coffee and a snack. Uh, we will carry on with the, the schedule. So um, I'd like to welcome Nicola Bailey um, to, to kick us off on the, the second session, um, getting, getting started into data elements. And he's going to present on the choosing what to work with. So it, how to consume data from fish base and sea life base. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. So good morning, uh, all people attending in person and good day, whatever the time it is in your place to all uh, Zoom attendants. Uh, first, thanks to Alex. Uh, he was a one uh, not responsible, but, but thanks to him, I am here uh, because he supported my, my trip. Uh, and uh, I really acknowledge him for that because it's uh, eight years from now, I left uh, Wallfish. So it, it was very nice to come back here. Even if I was based in the Philippines, I came here twice a year. And it's nice to see all people, all well, people older than they are and they were at that time. So yes, uh, I am usually the one, the only one who present the technical database stuff that all the rest of the fish base consortium member eight at, at all. Um, and uh, this word consume, it's, it's, it's a word that is used by big data people. I was shocked the first time I heard them that because consuming, you know, it, it doesn't fit fit well with uh, with a research on environment, but it's it's the world. Uh, so yes, as Alex said, it's it's to show how you can uh, extract uh, data uh, and and where. So the first uh, way uh, to extract data is directly from the master database. That you you. You can be surprised by, by the title of this slide mentioning MS Access 2019, because yes, after 12 years, no, 15 years, we will uh, move from Access 2003 that we are using and still using now to <laughs> Access 2019. Yeah! Well, uh, FishBase has always been data oriented and not IT oriented. And so the first years, especially I was not there, but, but people experienced bad, bad things when it came to update uh, software. And that's why we, we tried to slow down, but, but sometimes we are too slow. Um, it takes years or even decades in, in like in this case to, to, to move on. Um, okay, so uh, the first way you can get data from FishBase is, is to ask the team directly. 
and you can ask your, uh, uh, your request in natural language and the team transform in SQL queries and send you the details. Well, in fact, it's not always as easy as it seems because the devil is in details. It's just like when you go to fast food, you know, you order, oh, I want, uh, uh, I want this combo, uh, uh, and you think it will take two minutes uh, to, or less to take the, to give the command, and, and then uh, the girl or the, the guy ask you, well, do you want mustard or mayonnaise or ketchup? Uh, you, you want French fries or, or yam fries? Uh, the drink is Coke or, or Sprite or, or whatever, then it takes 10 minutes uh, to order some things that you will eat in less than two minutes. So uh, it's a little bit like that when people don't know too much about the, the, what, what fish base or silage base contain, you send them back what, what you have understood they requested. And then as they discover there, there are little things that that they didn't expect, that they said you back, oh no, but I didn't want that, and so on. So it takes time, it takes time. Just like as stupid as it is, give me a list of fishes in a country. Yes, but do you want the native ones and the, the present one, or do you want those that were misidentified, and so on. So it's, it's not simple, it, it takes time. Second, <laughs> and and Another way to do it, you can visit Los Banos, and especially if you have data of your own that you can input in Fishbase, uh, you would receive a training uh, uh, to, uh, to use a Fishbase and you could do in the end your own uh, queries. And uh, just a, rem a reminder, the Fishbase consortium member can obviously get a, a copy of, of the database. So if you are in need, you can always ask. So this way is a, obviously the most efficient way to get what you want because it's, it's, it's really at the, the core of, of the uh, database systems that, that, you, uh, that, that you touch. But obviously as well, it's not scalable. The team is not extensible. The time uh, is, uh, to be spent for, for answering questions like that is not extensible nor is the training uh, on, on site. So I, I show you this slide from a presentation of Reiner uh, 12 years ago, uh, celebrating the 20 years of Fishbase to show you uh, on which computer started uh, Fishbase. The youngest of you uh, may, have not, may have never seen these things. So after that, we, we disseminated the data on various disks. Uh, and, and on these disks, uh, you could access directly to the database. Also, it was not often exactly uh, the, the uh, master database, but a little uh, modified uh, version of it. Uh, but also, you could use uh, an interface with predefined queries. Uh, that simplifies uh, uh, your, your life. So um, we, uh, we distribute Fishbase first on this floppy disk uh, 3.5 uh, inch that you can see a picture of at the top right. Again, the youngest uh, of you uh, may not have seen these things. Uh, and well, Fishbase just escaped from the floppy disk uh, five and uh, a quarter inch and uh, the, the floppy eight inches and even the punch card, but it was closed. Uh, so then, uh, so the interface is, is in Visual Basic, which is a, a programming language that come with MS Access. And uh, during a, a fast period of a European project, uh, we could uh, uh, produce a, a yearly version of, of a CD-ROM. Uh, when this funding uh, uh, stopped, when the project was finished, we produced another one, but under a form of a DVD. And the most recent, uh, that is also the latest, and maybe the last question mark, uh, was published with the help of the Royal uh, Museum of Central Africa in, in Tervuren, who, who funded. 
Okay, so this way is easy to use on local computers, obviously, and you can do a lot of things because you can access uh, to the data to the data through the interface or directly through uh, SQL queries. But unfortunately for us, it's costly uh, because we already have the web interface. Uh, we have the encoder, so the, the interface uh, for entering data. And it's very uh, difficult to spend more time to create a third interface for that. So it's definitively uh, not a way that we want to pursue, but we should never say never. If there is a specific need with correct funding, we are always uh, uh, amenable to, to, to do a, a new one. Then, uh, then uh, Fiat, Fiat Web, the, the web came, and uh, you know the interface that you see on, on the right. But there, you can only access data through predefined queries. OK, you can change the parameters. You can select the species, the country, and, and the topic that you want. So you get the data. But uh, again, we, we are not an IT-oriented project. So to get the data on your computer, you, you have to copy paste. That's why we present the data always in the form of tables. So they are immediately usable in an Excel file, just copy paste, no downloading, uh, no, nothing. Uh, so again, it's easy to use, well, when you, you have a connection. Uh, also, there is, there is a heavy uh, search page. So we are currently uh, working on a new uh, simplified search interface that will meet the need of 80% of the 700 uh, visitors uh, per, per month. And still, we will keep this complex uh, 700,000. Yeah, OK. Uh, I, I thought I missed some zeros, but uh, yeah. But in that case, in the web, you, you lack the direct access to uh, uh, the table. That's why people are asking us and the team to extract data uh, for them. OK, and a third party uh, for 10 years now developed on Air R package that is called R Fish Base. So it's Carl Bettiger and Scott Chamberlain in the University of Berkeley. Um, so they, they did a great job, and uh, obviously all the predefined functions they, 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 uh, they created in that uh, package allows to go much deeper in, in, in FishBase, and you can extract much more data in much more different way uh, that, that, uh, that you need. And everything is on uh, GitHub, uh, very well explained. So when you know R, uh, well, it's, uh, it's a good option, uh, at least to explore the, the data that you need. You can always decide, well, you, you want more and ask us again. Uh, one of the problem is that they have hard time to update the data in synchronization with the update on the web. So very often we, we have uh, messages saying, why? why don't I have the same results uh, with the package and with the web? It's simply because it, it takes time for them to massage the, the, the database uh, in, in, in a new structure that, that they are uh, more familiar uh, with. Uh, and by the way, what we send to them is not the access database, but the MySQL database that we use uh, on the web. And uh, Scott Chamberlain decided to create an API, so application programming interface, which is a piece of software that allows to expose the data in a more generic way and, and where you can really access to everything if, if you want in, in the same manner. So it's a, a programmatic way to access uh, uh, the data that, that is very uh, uh, if efficient. Unfortunately, Scott left uh, last year. It was decommissioned. We received uh, many uh, messages asking us, but why doesn't 
doesn't it work anymore? We based our, our website on, on this uh, API and now we, we can't do anything. Um, so uh, it's, a, it's a problem uh, that we, we have to solve or maybe had to solve. Uh, so yes, we, we, you can go uh, deeper. So you can make all data accessible if it's what you, 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 you want to. And again, there, there was a good documentation. The, the little problem here is that you really go deeper in the database structure to be able to make the links with, between tables and to get uh, what, what you want. But, but with the documentation, the fish-based book and um, uh, the, the, the documentation of the API, it, it would be easy. Okay, there is another little API that is only in the Canada, Canadian server.ca, which allows you to download the classification, the list of species, uh, and, and the synonyms uh, mainly. Uh, now, last week, so it's fresh and fresh news. We had a discussion with Carl Bottiger, the one who created uh, our package. So they want to continue to maintain it. Uh, and, and their last update was in December 2021. Uh, we have to provide them the, the, the update of uh, August that will be out soon. And we asked him, but what about the API? Because we have many people asking around. And he suggested that we use the same way uh, as we have used for Cirandos using the uh, Amazon Web Service uh, S3 bucket uh, with uh, data formatted uh, in Parquet. Parquet is a format to simplify that is colon oriented. So the, the data of the same field are gathered rather than row oriented as it is in, the, in, main, in mainly in the uh, um, uh, relational uh, relational database. So it's it it is a little bit faster to use this format because very often you you ask only a certain number of fields in a table. So the columns can be extracted very easily rather than to have to extract all the row and to select the field in each row in each record. Uh, uh, to, to create your, 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 your data set. Um, and he even suggested that we could go uh, through JBIF, which seems to have the same type of agreement that the UBC, uh, the University of British Columbia, has with Amazon. And I think it's a good, a good idea because FishBase is not big data. Actually, the, the full the full uh, uh, database without pictures and without occurrence data uh, on access is less than one gig. So it's really peanuts. And uh, we are not sure if they would be even interested to host such tiny thing, even adding sea uh, life base. But together with uh, JBIF, it, it, makes, it makes sense because Okay, it's not big data as a whole, but there are little pieces to coming together, and uh, we may have uh, more help uh, from from them. So uh, we can use uh, Jupyter notebooks over this uh, uh, this API that is called the S3 A API, and you can program in R, in Python, and and other stuff, or you can use your own. Uh, uh, you own the development uh, uh, software. For sure, it's not for any user, and it's only for scientists who are able to to program and and some crazy nerds that like this uh, big data stuff. So the good point is that all data are potentially accessible through through this uh, uh, through this way. Um, we you wouldn't even need to store the data locally. You can uh, work uh, uh, directly uh, with uh, this, this data. 
And the good point is that we know already the technology through uh, what we did uh, for the sea around us. And it solves the synchronization updates because we would be the one uh, uh, updating uh, the data in, uh, in uh, Amazon and AWS. Uh, for sure, to use that again, uh, you would need to, to know a little bit about the database structure and for which we would need to create a, a little bit more uh, so uh, uh, documentation. Or, and or we can create Jupyter notebooks like we did for C around us that help people to, uh, to start and, uh, with the basic uh, queries. But to do all that, we definitely need funding. It's not something that we can do uh, aside. The, the last option uh, to consume uh, fish-based data is to, or sea life-based data is to go through aggregators. So for occurrence data, we serve, and we are the only one to serve this data, mainly uh, the Philippine collection and some trolling surveys that we are uh, the only one to, uh, uh, to serve. So you can get this data through JBIF OBIS at the moment. Uh, Fishnet, we, we have to, to still work on, on this. And why would you need to go through these aggregators instead of going directly to Fishbase? Is when you need to, to analyze all data on, on some species of fishes not only those that are in, in, in fish base. Well, the same is true for the taxonomy and the nomenclature. You can go to catalog of, uh, to, uh, it's a mistake, it's catalog of life, not catalog of fishes, catalog of life and, and worms. Not every piece of information that is in fish base is contained there and, and, and from far. But again, if you need to make list of species for one country, uh, you may want to, to use these aggregators to have all marine species in one go instead of going there, 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 and then merge uh, uh, the, the data set. For sure, here again, with these aggregators, there is a problem of synchronization. They don't have necessarily the most up-to-date version of fish base, either because they take time to integrate it easier because we take time to, to provide them. But depending on what you are doing, it might be a, a faster uh, solution. So uh, all approaches are, are valuable and they have pros and cons and it depends your, your knowledge in programming, what you want to do, uh, uh, what is the environment uh, you are in. And, uh, and for us, we, we can maintain the website and uh, this new API, but not much more uh, about that. Uh, so as I said, um, we have created a new interface that will be out soon for testing for everybody. And uh, we really have to discuss about this uh, uh, new API, but I think it's really where we have to go and it will be a project for the, the coming year. So I thank uh, many people. First, the uh, IT staff of ECLAM, Worldfish Center, Worldfish, Fin, Cuquatics. They were often the same. Uh, especially um, Skid Barile, who is here, who is uh, present for 25 years with us. And it's a record. And uh, she's at the head of the IT group uh, in, in the Philippines. So, and uh, it's for 25 years that we worked together. I realized that <laughs> writing this uh, acknowledgement, uh, we are not that young anymore. Okay, the people from uh, Berkeley, uh, because of the work they did on the R package and the API. The technical committee with Mike uh, Noren from NRM uh, at the head, uh, and who maintains several mirrors around the world and also uh, FBC staff member who maintain a mirror in their own university. And again, Alex, thank you for allowing me to be here today. That's it. Thanks a lot. Uh, any questions for Nicolas? 
I have one just uh, out of curiosity talking about the, the first uh, years of Fishbase, how it started up. I was wondering and, and thinking about what, what Esam said this morning from Eritrea, how did, how did people first hear about Fishbase and how did they then kind of get in touch and, and, and request the data? I'm curious how those... I, I think you have to ask Daniel because I was not there. You know, I, I started to work with uh, Fishbase in 1996 and on a very specific uh, project. But I, I think you, you made an effort to contact uh, 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 Department of Fisheries, in, in, in the, uh, especially in the tropical uh, world. Uh, and they present uh, they presented uh, fish base also the project uh, between 1996 and 2001 uh, was uh, the, uh, to present fish base as as uh, tools that could be that could help fishery management and there were several regional meetings in the Caribbean in West and East Africa in New Caledonia uh, where where fish base was uh, ad advertised at, at large. Early nineties, um, fish base was spread only by word of mouth. Um, but in ninety six, um, there was a review of fish base by um, Bob May, uh, who is who was a famous scientist in nature. It was more than a silver platter, the name of, of it. And that generated lots of positive. It was the CD-ROM. The, the CD-ROM opened, opened up the thing. And they also, uh, we got uh, mentioned from um, uh, um, project from the European Commission. Uh, in um, ACP country, uh, African, sorry, uh, Caribbean and Pacific country, the former African country. Uh, and um, <clears throat> we, we, we made it a, a part of thought. So uh, in, every, in every country that was there, came lots of people from neighboring countries. And that spread. But actually, the breakthrough I think, was the review in nature. Any other questions? Thanks a lot, Nicola. So next, I would like to welcome Chukwu Wu from, uh, from the Swaz Institute of Marine Science in, in Hong Kong, um, who is going to talk to us about wielding uh, data from citizen science. How do you show the full screen? Oh. Ah, I. Oops. Okay. <coughs> okay. All right. Uh, so, good morning, everyone. Um, I am. Um, from the Swai Institute of Marine Science in the University of, University of Hong Kong. Uh, so this presentation would be quite different from what uh, Nicholas just, just present. Uh, this one, uh, instead of how to, to saying like how to choose uh, what data to use, in this presentation, I'm going to tell uh, how to collect data from, from a citizen scientist. So here we go. The, the PowerPoint gonna have three 
three main parts. The first part is the story. Second part is the contribution to science from citizens, from citizen scientists. And the last part would be how to use the data and how to wield the data. So all story always start with uh, once upon a time. So once upon a time, there are two guys in Hong Kong. They really love diving. They learn how to dive. And then when they start diving, the first dive, they saw fish. They saw jellyfish. They saw some uh, like spiky shell, something like that in the seawater. And the more they dive, the more sea life they, they saw in the sea. But there's a problem in Hong Kong, which is the visibility. The visibility in Hong Kong is normally under five meter and sometimes even five centimeter. So how, how do they, and so yeah, so they have the difficulty of identifying different organisms in the sea. And it's difficult to memory, to, to memorize all the um, uh, animal they have met in the water. So how do they do? They get, ah, no, they didn't get this one, sorry. They get, an, uh, they get a camera. They get a camera in the water so their memory and can be, their memory can become uh, more vivid, which is like this. Uh, I guess you know what that is. Uh, and then when they get the camera, they realize the sea animal in the sea is not Pokemon. They actually will animals in the sea. They saw sea stars, they saw frogfish, porcupine fish, fish seahorses, many different animals in the water. And since they start diving with people, they met many people, they met many divers along the trip. And then those people have the same interest of understanding uh, what's happening in the ocean. They have passion in the ocean. They simply care about the ocean. So these two guys, they think, ah, maybe it's a good chance to, um, to start a project, to start a survey in Hong Kong to understand more, uh, more underwater world in Hong Kong. And this is actually a true story in Hong Kong. I mean, they are not a fan of Pokemon, but they met a lot of people. They, this is a real organization in Hong Kong, which is called, uh, not organization, it's a real project in Hong Kong called 114, 114E uh, with fish surfing. These people, they're amazing. How amazing? They work in different, they, they come from different areas in the society. Some are bartender, some are programmer, some are IT technician. And they, what, what they have in common is they enjoy diving. What makes them different is compared with, compared with like normal people who love shopping in Hong Kong, they, do, they also do shopping. They do window shopping under the sea. So uh, they spend the time, they turn the passion, spend, turn the time into a helpful set of eyes and hands uh, so more people can understand what's in the ocean. So now come to the second part, we un, um, which is contribution to science. What did it contribute? This program uh, have been running for at least four years and is still going on from 2018 to 2021. During this period, more than 200 volunteers have joined the program and they only uh, accept sighting photos and videos in uh, every time when they go up for survey. And then they, uh, they like 200 more than 200 people spend more than 3000 hours in the sea, which equals to 132 days in the sea. They dive in 55 sites in Hong Kong, mainly, I got the part, eh, doesn't work. <laughs> so they mainly dive in the east side of Hong Kong, the east side, the one with the numbers. They dive in the east side of Hong Kong because those area has higher visibility and less traffic in the area. And in these four years, they find more than 200 uh, volunteers, they find more than 30 new species that's never recorded in Hong Kong and in literatures. So now let's, let's take a look of the pictures, what they did, what they see in the sea. They saw a goby, oh no, sorry, a blenny. <laughs> 
they sort of blend in the sea. Uh, this one is not very common, and they and it's always stay inside a staghorn coral. So they never seen the whole body of the fish. That's so why it's unknown blending. And they also saw band fish. Uh, they always like sometimes live with couples. They love sandy bottom. They saw hawkfish. They saw cardinal fish. They saw many pictures. Uh, at least, I mean, it's a the, at least like um, two twenty thousand pictures have been taken during the survey by the um, by lots of different photographers. And what's most important, or what does those pictures tell us in the ocean? What's most important is they are in situ picture. They are in situ pictures, which show where do they live, what kind of habitat do they like. They like sandy bottom, or they like in the they like to stay in the water column. What behavior do they do? They do? Moreover, you will see um, the fish like on the, the the fish morphology difference when they change in the life stage. For example, the top row is the juvenile fish. The lower row is the I see um, uh, is the adult species. So they change a lot during different time of the life stage, right? Yeah, this sometimes make me feel like um, uh, human. When uh, when we are young, we try to we try to show off, we try to distinguish out. Uh, but when we get young, when we get old, we try to be a bit more humble. Uh, so, but don't worry, especially the young people here. When you 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 maybe you are doing your bachelor, you're doing your PhD or master. Uh, but at some point, maybe you will be successful like uh, the people, uh, the creator of fish base sit next to you. All right, yeah. I try to be encouraging, okay. <laughs> uh, so apart from fish morphology, a different life stage, we also, from the picture, we also observe the fish behavior. Uh, when we look at the lower left pictures, you saw a touch fish is sleeping, is sleeping with a bubbles. Um, making a bubble around the body. Without the picture, how can you tell the fish make a circle shape of bubbles? Maybe they make triangle shape, different shape of bubbles, right? So a picture really tells a lot of things. And then also um, you can see the egg development in a very common, uh, in a very common anemone fish, uh, Nemo, I let's call him, yeah. And some observer, some volunteer, they also realize, oh, some fish, they have different lifestyle. They change the color in different time of the day. In the daytime, it will be more yellowy. In the nighttime, it will be more pale. And with these pictures, we also understand uh, we, when we compare with other regions, we saw, oh, uh, in Taiwan, or in, oh, sorry, in Taiwan or in Malaysia, the anemone and anemone fish is could be more dark, maybe more sunlight over there. And but when you go to like different places, like go to Solomon Island or go to Hong Kong, the fish tend to be more orangey. And this color variation is also supported by another study they found in Japan for a group of, um, yeah. But even in different places in Japan, they have different color already. Yeah. As a cool paper, if you can have a look. So to conclude, um, the the one and four E projects with fish, with fish survey provide lots of data, provide lots of pictures to the database, and so far we have collect. I mean, as a collaborator in Hong Kong, I have collected more than two thousand around two thousand pictures from the diving community, and. With those pictures, it helps uh, enrich the database. Yep. Oh, another contribution is uh, the one for e projects. They find some fish. Uh, they find some first fish pictures on the database, which no one has found it before on the database. But now, because of a volunteer, they have the data with the pictures. And here, I would like to highlight one of the fish, uh, which is the the lower bottom, the goby, the coral goby. 
Uh, this coral goby is classified as like endangered uh, in IUCN red list. And people in Hong Kong, they only find it in, the, in this couple of years. And they find this fish, they only live next to coral. Um, so, and when you look up the information of this fish on the database, it doesn't have much information. So this species is clearly under study. But, um, but people in Hong Kong, we have been seeing this stay with the staghorn coral and they have even have egg on the coral. So to conclude, um, the citizen, science, citizen scientists, they're, um, they're important. They're important to us because they help the pictures, they turn the time to data. And this data help to fill data gap and the data gap, which at some point will support other research, other conversation management. We all know that like here, we all know fish base is an essential tool for everyone working on fish. And every tiny bit of enrichment on the database can eventually help what other people are doing. And in terms, the taxonomy information on the database help citizen scientists, sorry, help citizen scientists and the wider public to understand what's really happening in the world. And at the end is promote ocean literacy. Okay, at the end, just want to tell, uh, uh, I'm looking for help actually. Um, so 114E, the reef fish survey program is only one of the, uh, they are the, they're quite organized. They are, sorry, they are very organized and it's a cool project I have ever seen in Hong Kong. They employ the only uh, survey that has been running so systematically in Hong Kong. But there are so many divers in Hong Kong who took extraordinary pictures in the sea. Uh, and here, if you have the expertise in the following feet, in the following creatures and the fish, please let me know, please contact me. And I really need your help to identify the fish and to help the fish face. So here we go. This one seems like a, a lisa fish with a copper pot on the fin. Juvenile fish again. I don't understand. I don't want to know what they are. We see cool pictures. More juvenile fish. This diver, did, he took pictures at, uh, during the midnight. Yeah, because you know the, 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 uh, how to call it, the migration, right? Another one from, yeah, Nudie Ranch. Uh, people having difficulty to identify the species. Another Nudie, sea slut, a weird sea urchin and a sponge crab, oh, sorry, sponge uh, stream. So at the end, uh, thank you so much for, for your time. And I, I would like to thank you, show my gratitude to Swire uh, Trust and because they, they fund my project and also fund one for e fish, fish, with fish surfing. If you want to understand more about what's happening in Hong Kong, what fish here in Hong Kong, please go to one for e com. Thank you for my friend who is uh, preparing the, uh, the data for me. And also thank you for a couple of photographers. Thank you for people in Cube Cortex who helped me a lot uh, on data upload. Yeah. And this my, oh, sorry, that's my contact. Um, oops. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks very much. It's great. Nice to see some, uh, some, uh, a marine biologist that still gets to be in the water and still gets to take lovely pictures. I often get asked, oh, wow, you trained as a marine biologist. That must be a dream job. You go diving every day. And I'm like, not quite. No, I don't really. <laughs> Now I found who does. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Any any questions? Uh, Daniel. Clearly, clearly, this is this one wonderful. And um, clearly, uh, the people who contribute these images uh, are contributing 
to making fish paste much better. Do they, do they individually become collaborator? Are they invited to be collaborator? Because yes. that's one way to, to, to highlight their contribution. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for most of the picture here, um, if they are known, they, I mean, sorry, let's say one, this project. You see my this one and four E. Uh, they have officially become the the fish bay collaborator, and I'm still looking for. Um, uh, since like in citizen science, citizen scientists, they have they have difficulties of identifying species. So um, I'm trying to getting more people into fish base into sea life base, but they're still working on like the true taxonomy and looking for expertise to help the project as well. Yeah, so they become, most of the picture here, like I show like they be, uh, the organization become the collaborator already. Yeah. Like a slight hint. Yeah, Nicola. Well, I, the problem is that you rise is a problem of all all citizen science projects uh, around the world. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the solutions that has been put in place by iNaturalist is self-evaluation. Self mm -hmm. I mean, uh, across the, the, the uh, providers of mm -hmm. Because some people know well some species, even if they are not specialists know well because they are personal history or interest and they can say yes and and the um, the quality of ID identification is measured on how many people will confirm the identification uh, they, they, they have that also in a, in a, in a French uh, French website that is called Doris where it's the same people talk to each other do you think that and, and they, they put apart the, the picture where really people don't know what, what it is. Mm -hmm. And only those pictures are sent to specialists. Because you can imagine that if you have a few specialists in the world uh, on some fishing, they will be overflow by, by request. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I have a suggestion that, that you, you may want to explore the possibility to put your picture in iNaturalist as, oh. as a separated project that would be called and and you you would keep your, your website mm -hmm. but you, you you would allow cross identification to, to occur more more easily. yeah and and also uh, it's a big thing iNaturalist so will not disappear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in, in two years from now. Mm -hmm. uh, so it also ensures the continuity of your project. Imagine that you, you don't want to, to, to take care about that. You want yeah. To become your yeah, uh, I really agree with you. And, uh, and this is already happening in Hong Kong. Yeah, so really thank you for your comment. Yeah, and most of us are we're using iNaturalist to identify species, but um, also look at the textbook is also important. And uh, since here, since today I have so many expertise here, so I'm, <laughs> that's why I asked for if anyone who knows. Yep. Uh, thank you for, like Alex said, reminding us of why we all became marine biologists, um, <laughs> the beauty that lies beneath. So I have a scientific question. You mentioned that 30 of your species are new identifications to Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. Do you think that some of those are simply because they weren't noticed before or they might be new arrivals due to climate change? Uh, okay, it's a good question. Um, that's where we go back to my, my friend paper. This is like, he's like still preparing the data, uh, but since uh, one of the, the coordinator, Stan, he's one of the experts in um, Hong Kong fish ID. Uh, and we're pretty sure with the, I mean, we, they, they haven't compared the data with the, like, um, the, the camera data, but 
but they're pretty sure like in different times of the year or even different year, they have new species in a certain place. So uh, they think it's a new species we um, exist in Hong Kong recently, but not sure what the reason is. Yeah, hope you're honest. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right, so our last uh, presentation before uh, a lunch break. Uh, Deng, um, you're up. And Deng Palomares is going to talk to us about the impact of activity level and temperature on fish growth. Take it away, Deng. This mic thing again. Okay, right. Hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody. Um, this, this presentation is actually based on a publication that it was recently published, this work that we that I'm presenting to you now. And it's a short communication in environmental biology of fishes. Now it this work, how do you I took there? This work actually um, uses fish-based data, the massive amount of fish-based traits data, to test uh, three hypotheses. The first one being that um, the increasing temperatures increase the rate at which uh, maximum size of fish is approached. And um, we are testing here the growth parameters of the von Bertalanffy growth function, the W infinity, the size, and K, which is the rate, well, it can be uh, analogous to the rate at which the fish approaches W infinity um, with increasing temperature. And we know what the relationship of growth in length and growth, growth in weight are, and therefore we can use growth in length data that's available in fish base and transform them to weight to growth in weight. Um, the next hypothesis is activity level. So the effect of activi activity level on, uh, the effect of temperature on activity level. And uh, we measure activity level using the aspect ratio of the caudal fin, which is the height of the caudal fin squared divided by its surface area. Now we're saying that this is related to activity that aspect ratio, and that fish with high aspect ratio have or spend much energy on swimming, they swim a lot, and will have larger gills that is, are needed to supply the required oxygen to maintain their high metabolic activity. So we're saying that if A increases, uh, K will also increase with increasing uh, temperature. Um, and then the other hypothesis being tested here is the effect of um, temperature on longevity, uh, because we're saying that high temperatures will decrease the longevity as the K increases. And now what kind of data do we have in fish base that permits us to test these three hypotheses? And in the pup growth table, uh, so this, ta this table, the name of this table is um, related to the um, encoding platform in FishBase. And the, the, the pup growth table contains over 4,200 K L and L infinity data pairs for more than a thousand species. And this L infinity and K data pairs 
ha are, ha are estimated for the same population and are uh, provided also with the water temperature of the sampling location. So as I was saying earlier, we converted L infinity to weight infinity using the length weight uh, relationships um, that are also available in the length, uh, length growth table in FishBase. The other information that we get from FishBase is the aspect ratio of the caudo fin. And that is provided in the swimming speed table of, of fish base for the over 1,000 species that we have. And the temperature here, we use the temperature expressed as Kelvin or 1,000 over Kelvin. Um, why? Because we know that in another uh, study, we were able to show that um, temperature expressed in Kelvin has an effect on the food consumption per unit biomass of, of fish. Um, so we're using the same um, uh, variable here. We expressed uh, K and W infinity and A as logarithm, uh, logarithmic uh, terms. And we tested this hypothesis that these three variables affect um, that the temperature uh, has a relationship with these three va variables using this regression that we show here. Um, this is the composition of the data sets. So we're saying we are, I'm, I'm showing this to you just so that you know that there is no say bias created by the, the, the data sets or within the data sets and, and that we have the whole um, um, range of sizes and the whole range of aspect ratios and the whole range of temperatures that are uh, being tested here. Now, it's we had very good results uh, with a high multiple R and a standard a, a good standard error that is significant. And here we show that indeed there is a relationship. Temperature affects growth in weight and um, aspect ratio and um, K, so the growth in K. Uh, K is expressed in years, uh, W infinity in grams, and as I said, temperature in Kelvin. So it, this is the main result, but actually if we tested the, the, the regression variates, you know, the standard deviation units that we get, and we tested the partial slopes of um, uh, K with double infinity, K with temperature, and K with aspect ratio, we see that accounting for temperature has a stronger effect than accounting for activity level. And therefore, the temperature effect here is not, um, cannot be, um, how do you say that, cannot be disregarded. So we need temperature to get this relationship, this empirical relationship. Just to show um, how the, the, again, the breadth of um, data that we have for the 4,000 data points, the both, both uh, cloud of points in, in this graph show you the W infinity in the axis in the x axis and k in the in the y axis and the cloud of points show you that this is actually a normal cloud of points that you would expect for um, fish species. Um, the isolines that we, uh, we that we show here are is isolines that are are um, showing us what are the, the, the behavior of K and W infinity given, for example, on in the top graph, um, the, what is uh, for a typical fish with an aspect ratio of two, and that is, for example, reef fishes, snappers, groupers, um, that uh, along three levels of temperatures. So that's 10, 20, and 30. We can show that 
if you have a, a, a temperature of 20 degrees, your K is usually lower than when you have a temperature of 30 degrees. Uh, in the bottom uh, uh, graph is showing the relationship of for an average temperature of 20 degrees uh, for fishes with, aspect, with different uh, types of aspect ratio. So you have high aspect ratio, for example, tuna, because these are sustained swimmers. They swim all the time and therefore they need lots of oxygen. Um, for let's say cruisers like jacks, mackerels, and for um, let, uh, more um, less moving fish, um, snappers, or, or maybe even um, gobies, right? Because they just stay attached to the, to the surface, uh, to, the, to the bottom, <laughs> yeah. So um, bet this, this isolines actually give you an idea of what happens or the, 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 what happens between species. Um, within species is a different uh, matter, but we did not test that in this, in this um, uh, study. So between species, this is what you will expect to happen. Now there was a, a question. Uh, yeah, I am dizzy. Sorry, <laughs> I'm dizzy. My glasses. Um, there is there is a, a subset of data that we used to test um, the relationship of K and T max, um, because there was a question when, when one of the reviewers asked us what happens with K and 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 uh, longevity. So here, the, it, we were testing whether high temperatures will incre decrease or increase longevity. So high temperatures will um, decrease longevity. So because K increases, that, that's a known, that's a known um, we know that it happens, but we haven't shown it yet. And so with the data in the pop growth table for 2,100 something species, we were able to show with a high uh, um, inverse, a high, highly significant inverse uh, relationship between K and longevity. And so that's, that's another result. Um, so this, this, this small study, it's a small study, it was done in one week. And, and uh, it's because fish base is there. Fish base has the massive amount of life history traits data that can be used for hypothesis testing. And this is just one of the examples that we have because there are others, other examples already before Reiner Frosey uh, keeps publishing these kinds of empirical relationships using fish based data. So takeaway message, fish remain smaller in high temperatures and thus temperature is an important parameter uh, to, investigate in, uh, to investigate the relationship of fish growth, longevity and natural mortality. Uh, K increases with temperature and it, this reduces longevity and rapid growth correlates with high activity levels. Actually, this is the novelty of this species because it has never been shown before. Um, although we did know that aspect ratio of the caudal fin affects food, consum food consumption per unit biomass. So with this data, we can now add this equation for us to be able to know what is what is K if we knew what temperature is and what W infinity is and what is the aspect ratio. That's it, actually, it's a small study. And uh, <laughs> thanks to Daniel who kept pushing us to do this because he said it can be done and it's not going to take you long. And it did actually, it did take us long to write it up but it didn't take us long to analyze it. Um, 
And then I am here standing before you and not giving this talk via Zoom, uh, thanks to the Blue Abacus um, NGO for funding my trip to Penang. Questions, please. I'm busy. Would you rather stand down here? I think it's because I'm, I'm you know, it's sit this down. height I thing. Sit down for questions. Yeah, the transition between the screens. Uh, any questions for Jessica? Uh, thanks, Deng. That was really interesting. I, I'm a wee bit confused because your results are showing that more active fish grow faster. But then I thought, is that because they can eat more because they are more active? Because I would have thought being more active burns off more energy and it would reduce your growth. No, we, it, uh, we know that if you are, if you are uh, more active, you, are, you have a high metabolic rate. And this high metabolic rate would make you grow faster to the, your, towards your weight infinity. No, basically, there is this fallacy in fishery science and in fish biology that growth um, eats up most of the metabolic uh, that most of the metabolic rate of the oxygen and food consumed is devoted to growth. And therefore, anything else you do will be affecting growth. But actually, growth, somatic growth, consumes about 10% only of the food or oxygen you, you, the fish take, only about 10%. The rest is for activities. So, so you can actually have a high metabolic rate and a high growth at the same time, because actually growth, somatic growth, consume very little energy. And uh, this is not so controversial, but what is controversial is the notion that the fish stop growing because they reproduce. This is embedded deeply in, in textbooks and in papers. You see uh, people writing papers about the fish stop growing because they, they reproduce. And I can list 10 papers, 20 papers from memories and then hunt, find 100 that say that. And it's always wrong because, because the fish that uh, you have in an aquarium that is lonely and never has sex, stop growing. We also stop growing even if we don't reproduce. And uh, the notion that reproduction is, uh, in, takes away from growth and vice versa is simply nonsense. But it is a widespread nonsense and therefore it, it is reproduced uh, all the time. Actually, Fish, uh, but because they use so little of the of the energy for growth, about ten percent, uh, they just need to be a bit more quiet and to produce the energy that they need for growth. And it's very similar, if I may say that, to the situation with pregnant women. Pregnant women are always told they must eat a lot because they there are two of them. Right? It's nonsense. The pregnant woman reduce the activity a little bit. You don't see them running a lot when they're pregnant, and that's enough for producing the baby from the food that they normally eat. And, and on top of that, it is possible that mammals reduce the, we are mammals, right? Reduce the metabolic rate, the, uh, pardon me, the temperature by about half a degree. That is not detectable, and that's enough to to generate the energy that you need to make a baby. So the textbooks are wrong. They are completely wrong in this. <laughs> Thank you for the, uh, the impromptu uh, fish biology lecture, Daniel. That's fascinating. <laughs> um, any other questions for Jos? Yeah. It's Maybe I was confused a little bit, Deng, when you, when you showed that 
first graph with the aspect ratio of two and you had the temperature lines in it, yeah. it was like 10, 20, and 30 degrees Celsius. 10, the lower one was 10, and the higher one but was you 30. Have a, you have a lot of data below and above it, so. Yeah, I was, a, a, it, was, it was because we needed to show it for the same, uh, for the same. Yeah, it's just, it's just showing you uh, for the same, what was it, get me. But the same aspect ratio. Yeah, so we'll aspect ratio of two, yes, but yeah. does that mean that, okay, maybe I misunderstood it, but that you go further upwards to 40 degrees and no, okay, that's. Imagine, imagine it's a multiple regression, but it, if it were a single regression, you would have a, yeah. you would have variance around it. So around everything you have variance. So if you try to, show some lines you will always have variance around this is not doesn't mean that it, you it, could make it yeah. further is a, as a line. so for, for for example you have two species of snapper uh with with the, the same aspect ratio but one lives at 20 and the other lives at 30 then you'll have a higher yeah. and if you want to show something in the multivariate sense you have to fix they, you can show only two variables you can only shoot yeah so you, you have, have three axes. The other <laughs> axis at some value that is arbitrary. Yeah. Yeah, that, that so it, it is twelve thirty. I have a, a cheeky last question um, as as uh, the moderator. Um, so you have a kind of unique advantage to accessing fish-based data. Um, one through, through marriage <laughs> and through being part of the consortium. So I'm wondering what is the workflow for um, a study like this if our Malaysian colleagues or other, other researchers want to carry out a study like this using fish-based data, how would they approach that? So there's... Well, the, the, the first thing is uh, they have to tell us what they want to do if the data, if, if it, the data is not available via the pre-programmed uh, tables in, in the website. So if you cannot extract the data via the website and it, you, we need to customize the data for you, then you call us. I mean, you email us, not call. <laughs> you email uh, either it, it's or the R or the R package. So many people I work with in in North America, for example, they are really used to extracting data from fish base using the R package. They only ask me uh, questions if they do not understand the structure or if the the the, the data that they need are not actually available by, via the R package. So there are, uh, what, what Nicola said, right? You can extract using the R package. You can extract from the pre-programmed uh, um, things in the website, or if you cannot extract using those uh, tools, then you, you call us <laughs> and we can help you extract the data. Of course, we need to know what what you're, you need to do before we can extract the data for you. It's a, there's a workflow. There's a workflow there as well. And that involves either Nicola or myself and one of the IT people or a research assistant at Fishbase or at Sea Life Base. Fantastic. Thank you, Deng. And, and thank you to, Sam, did you have a question? Thank you very much, uh, Dang. Uh, that was an excellent uh, presentation. Um, just a, a quick um, question, uh, a bit provocative in a way, because I was thinking, and I, I do this to myself okay, all the time, you know, so what, you know, uh, and I think it's really um, important uh, to see 
these relationships, and particularly when you factor in the temperature, you know, variable partly because you know under changing climate. That's how I was thinking, you know, in terms of you know how that would affect productivity, etc. But within the reasonable uh, temperature uh, range, right? And um, I could see the value of that in informing policy and investment decisions. For instance, you know, particularly recently we've been talking a lot about you know how do you future proof or climate proof your fisheries policies for instance right and the role that you play is there but also similarly from the private sector interest as well um to make you know informed investment decisions in terms of you know which species where will be affected by how much that's sort of very fundamental question um could this approach be could that could this be sort of you know partly an answer to that sort of question at least in terms of an approach and if so what could that look like in terms of you know what how can this be packaged to inform policy and investment decisions well it, it depends on on um, what kind of data is needed to inform the policy decision and if we are talking of what data is in fish base and if we can uh, customize the data so that it can respond to the needs of policy, policy decision making, uh, we can do that. I mean, I, what I showed here was just an example of, of what can be done with the data, right? Um, so policy, policy decision that might be involving climate or so, we know where species what is the temperature preference of a species? That data is in fish base as well. And if the temperature preference of species, uh, if, if temperatures in, in certain area um, increases or decreases outside of the temperature preference of the species, what would be the effect of that on those species? So that can be that can be uh, responded to because we have geographic information in fish base, and we have the preferred temperature in fish base. So it's just a matter of customizing according to the needs of the policymaker. And Daniel has something to say. This paper of then was is a part of a special issue on fish in a warming world, in a warming and deoxygenating world. And uh, there's 15, uh, 15 other contributions. And uh, I was a guest editor of that issue of environmental biology of fish. Essentially, the, 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 the issue is addressed to the IPCC because there is a big debate on, in the, within the IPCC about the effect of temperature. And uh, what how the effect works, how how fish are affected, and there is a debate among physiologists that are not up to standard or that uh, don't respond to the question of the IPCC because the IPCC needs general rules, and uh, physiologists tend to say this is different for each fish. And um, the, the debate now is finding general patterns that hold across the board so that you can make prediction within the IPCC. And I think, I think about uh, uh, within IPBS also. And um, tomorrow I will talk about global warming effects on fish. And you will see that this is part of the story. Uh, it's part of the story that uh, the effect uh, uh, or that uh, fish, uh, the modification of the growth parameters of fish actually comes via the gills and via the oxygen consumption. And um, there is a big debate because physiologists do not accept that. M many of them don't. And because they are not familiar with large data set, they are not familiar with uh, statistics, which <laughs> And uh, because the fish that they put in the little plastic, um, they, 
they, they are under such horrendous, unrealistic conditions that the, 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 con the conclusion you derive from these experiments are mainly wrong. And uh, this debate is very important because within IPCC, they can make a statement only when there is agreement in the consensus in the literature that they look at. And right now, there is no. And this is toward achieving consensus about broader pattern. So there is no direct utilization of the result itself, but there is um, the attempt of arming a debate and making thus the IPCC capable of speaking without being contested. Thank you, that takes us to lunch. Um, thank you to all the presenters of the morning. Uh, it, we plan to be back for 1.30, so we've got just under an hour for lunch. Um, it's in the cafeteria, and just follow the crowd if you're not quite sure where you're going. Um, back at 1.30 for um, some talks, all of which will actually be presented remotely, um, four talks on, on growth and morphology. Thanks very much. Enjoy your lunch. It's a bit of background noise, so that's not, for, especially for online participants, if you are um, listening into this, it's not actually noise that's coming from here. It's on a recorded presentation, just to make you aware of that. So there's nothing we can do about it. Um, say again. Ah, thanks, Daniel. Yeah, offering to make additional noise. Um, good. So, if I can hand it over to the technical team and to Thanasis's uh, recording. Thanks. Thank you. Can you hear me? Uh, look, yep, uh, we can hear you, Thanasis, yeah. Oh, go okay. Ahead. Shall I share my screen now? Uh, or... Yes, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Hi, this is Athanasius Cicliras. I'm in Greece right now. I wish I was there with you, but unfortunately I couldn't make it to Penang. I'm going to present the, our work with Danai Mandopoulou on remodeling somatic growth space in feces. We know that uh, it's very well documented uh, today that fish sizes are shrinking, either because of overfishing a condition that is termed fishing down. This is mainly related to the past conditions and to overfishing or by the oxygen depletion they experience as they grow. And this is mainly related to the future in climate change. There has been many uh, work documented uh, the different growth of fishes in higher and lower temperatures and uh, in theory, and as well as uh, examples that will be all published in a special issue in environmental biology of fishes. Now, the, uh, this uh, fish size shrinking has many ecological consequences, uh, one of which is the production of less eggs, as uh, larger fish are generally better spawners and they produce uh, exponentially more eggs compared to smaller ones. Uh, the problem with this uh, shrinking sizes is that most uh, uh, equations in uh, stock assessments are dated 
and do not really correspond to present growth. So uh, in many of these cases, uh, the, the, the updated uh, growth curves uh, are lacking old age groups and large individuals, which are very rare. So this uh, condition has not been fully quantified in age-based assessments in terms of age length keys, maturity, fecundity, recruitment, biomass, and all these have consequences for the future cuts. So in this work, we try to create a single metric of growth potential that incorporates both fish length and age are the same equation by estimating the area that corresponds to the von Bertalanffy growth curve, provided that the growth parameters in maximum age are known for uh, species. This uh, metric we will use to examine the effect of historical and future anthropogenic forcing on fish populations and estimate how much biomass is lost due to the non-optimal use of somatic growth. Uh, this is the basic equation of uh, growth. Uh, many of them have been proposed. The one that is most extensively used is the von bertan uh, growth curve, which has two known parameters, length at age, and estimates three unknown, which is the asymptotic length, the rate at which this is approached, and the hypothetical age at zero length. With this equation, we calculated the area using the definite in integral of growth function with limits T1 and T2, uh, where T2 is larger than T1. And we used, we set as T1 uh, zero or T0, and the upper limit T2 was set at T max. We came up with these two equations right here. And based on this and the uh, known growth parameters and maximum age, we estimated this area under the growth curve for 186 Mediterranean fishes. We plan to do this for as many uh, species as possible. Uh, this is very preliminary. We're only presenting here how it looks with large medium and small size demersal and pelagic fishes. And we also use this to uh, determine interspecific growth variability for 50, around 50 sardine populations that grow differently in the Atlantic and the Mediterranean Sea. And we are making some correlations of this growth area with various other parameters. One of them is the prior R that appears in fish base for most species and is based on SOG assessment. And we also use this uh, area to uh, check a hypothetical example where the fish has declined in size and ages. And we, we can see here that the, there are two growth curves, the one corresponding, the, the pink one, to the historical uh, age and length structure, and the purple one corresponds to the one with the stringing uh, lengths and ages. Uh, in the future, we will relate this to fecundity numerically and the energy output and examine the effects of on stock biomass and future cuts. Uh, we have many issues to resolve. One of them, they are all listed there in the top right, left of this slide, the units of measurement, the name of this metric. We need to check in detail uh, where the growth parameters have been estimated in the proper way or they are questionable to decide on how to use T0, which in some sometimes it's very negative, deviates from zero. Uh, we need to check all the outliers and decide how to deal with sharks and rates, with, which exhibit a different growth compared to all other uh, fin fishes. And the challenges for, for the future is to calculate this growth loss from overfishing for most commercial fishes globally, numerically estimate the effect of quantity recruitment and biomass, compare the fishing down versus the oxygen limitation effect effects on growth, 
uh, check intraspecific growth variability and find a way to include this uh, as a parameter in fish base. Uh, in the future, I will be traveling to Canada and meet with Daniel with that. And also Rainer is visiting Greece in 2023. And we will have the chance to work on these issues together, hopefully. Uh, that's all for me. Thank you very much. If you have any questions. Thank you very much, Thanasis. Um, do we have any questions in the room? Let me just check on. Yes, Neil. Thank you, Athanasis, um, for your very clear presentation and very interesting work. Uh, it's Neil Lonergan from Murdoch University. Uh, I was really glad you flagged a T0 and some of the very neg negative estimates that we see. I think we might have lost Athanasis. No, we're back. Um, I've seen many estimates which uh, are greater than minus one or minus two, which means that our curves and estimates of K may well be um, gross, grossly biased. And I just wondered if you had any thoughts on how you might approach that issue of those estimates of T0, which cannot be correct. No, so far we decided to exclude the T0 values that uh, deviate more than 1 point, minus 1.5 from 0. Uh, but uh, we are also thinking of simulating some stocks and re-calculating uh, the growth curves. Uh, but yes, th this, is, this is a major issue for stock assessments altogether because it uh, shifts the, for one age or so the growth curve. Uh, it's indeed a very uh, important issue that we need to deal with. Thank you. Thanks, Thanasis. Uh, over to Reiner, I think, has a comment online. You can just unmute yourself and... and... Yes, good morning, everybody. From Greetings from sunny Kiel, Germany. Well, um, on the issue of T0, basically, uh, in, in my experience, large values, large negative values, indicate that um, the selectivity of small fish is biased towards the fast growing ones. Meaning uh, if they have the same age, you only get the larger ones of that age. And that then leads to a, a lifting of the curve and, and a, a larger T0. And basically, I don't think there's much you can do it other than fix it. I mean, have a prior for T0 in the range of a maximum of 10% of maximum age, which you have. So that often comes to a maximum of minus one, um, something like that. And you force it to not go bad. This will also result in a better fit. The other issue could be that the very large ones are missed by your gear, which is often the case in, in research gears, which are meant to catch juveniles. The large ones can just outswim it, so to speak. And, and they're not so big nets. So again, they can easily uh, go above or beside them. And you miss them. And there you have the opposite problem of catching at the same age, the smaller ones. Then, and this gives you a more flattened curve and that is then reflected in T0. So forcing it to closer to the origin would give a better fit, I think. Um, that, that's all one can more or less do. Thanks. Thanks, Rana. Um, then as is a, a, a question from online is, uh, says, it's really interesting work, which software package have you used um, all along? So far, we, we only use the, the data from FishBase and run some scripts in R to, to model uh, this area, which will be available to anyone who want to use it once we finalize it. Uh, 
Fantastic. Thanks a lot, Thanasis. I think that's it for questions. Thanks for joining us. It's great to have you. I hope it's not too early. <laughs> no, no, it's not. Thank you very much. Okay, next up, um, we have a recorded presentation. I think Eman Salem uh, Al Fagani calling in from Libya is, is actually online. Um, am I right in saying you'd like to present using the recording, though, Eman? I see that you can unmute yourself if you want to say hello. Otherwise, we'll proceed and, uh, with the, the recorded um, presentation. Eman is going to present on otolith morphology and relationships of common Pandora captured from the East Libya Mediterranean coast. Hi, Eman. If you are online, can you unmute yourself? Because we can't currently hear you. Okay, there we go. Good morning, Eman. Good morning. Ah, excellent. Thanks for joining. Okay, we can now see your screen and, and we can hear you. Please proceed. Please, just one minute. Okay. Uh, hello, my name is Iman Salem Al Firjani from Libya, uh, staff member of Faculty of Science, Department of Marine uh, Science. Thank you for giving me a chance to participate uh, in Fish Database Conference. My search uh, about the morphological characteristic of the otolith of Bagillas Arthrinias and the relationship between fish size and okay fish size and outer dimension. Can you hear me? Yes, we can all hear you great. Okay. Thanks. Introduction. Uh, okay. Uh, otoliths are calcareous structure found in the inner air of fishes that help with hearing and balance. There are three birds such as Sagita, Labelli, and Stressi. Uh, these bird structures record the life history of fishes and contain a lot of information on their age and size. Morphological characteristics of uh, fish otolith are highly variable between species. Uh, this uh, the present study fo focus on the sagita, the largest of three birds of the otolith and most group telocity. The relationship between fish size and otolith dimension can be used to determine original price size from length or weight or height of azulated otolith is a necessary step in understanding uh, the feeding ecology of Biscifora uh, uh, animal. Libya is uh, one of the most important country bordering in the Mediterranean Sea, as it has a coastal line about uh, 1,950. Uh, special studies uh, of the otolith are a few. This study helped to provide information about uh, fish uh, otolith uh, shape and the relationship between fish size and otolith dimension. Aims uh, first uh, establish uh, estimation of length weight relation and condition factor uh, to establish uh, the morphological characteristic of the otolith then to determine the relationship between fish size and otolith dimension. Material and method. Sample were collected from the coast of Benghazi city, located in the eastern part of Libya. Bagillas erythrinias, the fish from the family of uh, Speridi, usually found uh, on sandy or muddy substrate and at a depth uh, of 40 to 200 uh, uh, meters. A common length uh, is 20 to 25, it's a first uh, and second class fish according to size in Libya. 37 fish were collected uh, during winter 2022. 
before the section morphological measurement were taken as a total uh, weight, total length, uh, standard length, and uh, head length. Uh, the power regression model was used to find the relationship between fish size and otolith, uh, fish size uh, between uh, length and weight. Okay, for condition factor pattern was used. Uh, morphometric measurement of otolith, uh, the weight was taken by using a system balance, also the length and the height and area of the otolith, in addition to the length of the thalcus, the ostium, and coda. These measurements were taken by using Digimizer software. Uh, the morphological description was based on the terminology of Schwarzens and Toast. We used six morphological percentages, such as otolith length slash total length, otolith length slash head length, otolith height slash otolith length, sulcus length slash otolith length, ostium length slash uh, sulcus length, coda length slash sulcus length. In addition to the otolith relative size uh, represented by the equation shows, uh, we use uh, the power regression model to determine the relationship between fish, uh, between fish size uh, with otolith dimension and the relationship between length of the otolith and other measurements. Finally, data analysis uh, by using DG, uh, SPS and XL. Results. First table shows uh, the morphology, morphometric uh, measurement of Bagillus arthrenia average length was uh, 18.56 centimeter, the weight was uh, 19.96 gram, and the value of the condition factor was 1.28. Uh, Figure two, uh, it shows the relationship between length and weight based on the value of regression of uh, coefficient which was 2.99, uh, the relation was isometric growth. Uh, table, uh, second table shows the measurement of uh, otolith. Through the independent test, it's clear that there is no statistical difference between right and left otolith, only use it left side to find the regression. This slide first shows uh, the image of the right and left uh, otolith of Bagillus arthrenius, which, which have a pentagonal shape with heterosalcoid, sulcus of length, uh, 4.43 to 9.7 millimeter, a funnel-like uh, uh, shape, ostium, of length 1.94 to 4.47 and uh, tubular coda of length 2.45 to 5.20 millimeter. The posterior region and the anterior region are angled and dorsal, lobed, uh, ventral region, crenata. Uh, table four shows the morphological uh, index, uh, for example, the length of the otolith constituted 4.04 percentage of the total length of head uh, of uh, fish, while the, uh, the otolith length constituted 16.58 uh, of uh, head length. <clears throat> also, the elongation ratio in the shape of the otolith represented by the, uh, the otolith height uh, slash otolith length, which was uh, 72.85. Um, Salcas uh, length constituted 86.54 uh, uh, of the otolith uh, length. So we may consider otolith is large in size, large in size uh, according to OR, which was 0 0.69. These indicators are useful tools for taxonomy. Table five uh, shows the relationship between uh, of uh, length of uh, uh, otolith and the rest of uh, otolith uh, parameter uh, was very strong and the coefficient of determination was higher between the length of, uh, of uh, otolith and otolith highest, which was 0 0.97. Table six uh, shows the relationship between uh, fish size and auto dimension, the coefficient of determination showed values range from uh, 0 0.95 for fish size uh, with otolith weight to uh, 0 0.80 uh, 
five for fish length with otolith length. So there is a possibility of determining the fish uh, size through the otolith uh, size. Hence, it's uh, used in uh, support of the feeding, eco feeding habit study and fishers research. Thank you for listening. For any question or comment, uh, please uh, write to me through emails. Thank you very much, Aman. That was that was great. Um, very nicely put together presentation. I should get your advice on doing my own slides. This is uh, the you... first time. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Well done. Um, do we have any questions in the room for Aman? Just one sec. I'll look online. So we have one on online. Um, I'm not sure if you can see that question, Eman, in the question and answer. So it says, uh, hi, good work. In one of the introduction slides, you mentioned the fish distribution between 40 uh, meters to 200 meters. Though this is not your work, my interest is how could the preferred depth of the fish be estimated? Is it through netting or satellite-based tags? or is it through the otolith, otolith base? I'm not sure if you can see that question and if that makes sense. Yes, that one, I think they're referring to. Uh, the detail uh, in, uh, about uh, depth, uh, uh, um, write uh, this uh, by email, uh, by uh, book uh, Golani. Yes, I think they're referring to that Golani. one. Uh, this is the reference. Okay, so they, they should refer to that paper for more information. Uh, Golani et al. 2006. Okay, another question online is um, how to find the prey size from the dimensions of otolith. Is that possible? Any comments in the room? You want to comment on that? Uh, Daniel's just coming with the mic. As long as an otolith is not eroded by the gastric juices, you can establish the kind, the size of the animal that has been, or fish that has been consumed, if you have the ratio between the size of the otolith and the size of the fish such as presented here. So if you have such ratio for uh, lots of fish, and I think we have it in this space, you can, from the size of the otolith in the gut, in the stomach, you can infer the size of that have been consumed. Oh, uh, yeah, you, you can do that. As long as, again, as, uh, as the uh, stomach content, as not a uh, stomach acid, have not eroded stuff, but you can see it, uh, it, uh, it, it has been eroded. And this method is used a lot, uh, not to study the diet of fish, but to study, study the diet of marine mammals. Uh, marine mammal fish, and uh, you can see the, the size of the fish. Um, I have colleagues in the BC that works on marine mammal, and they always study that. That Great. is a standard method. That Thanks, Sonia. Uh, all right. I hope that answers your question, Kunja Lakshmi, online. Um, yes, Jessica, in the room. Uh, thank you, Iman, for a very interesting presentation. I like that you included um, the condition index. And we did some work that showed that 
using size, body size, otolith, and condition that you could infer um, the presence or absence of sharks as predators on the species. So where sharks were abundant, uh, the fish condition was poor and vice versa. I'm wondering if you have any information on either predation of the species by sharks or by fishermen. Hey man, just remember to unmute yourself if you can respond to that question. Hey man, so the question was if you have any data on shark predation or human. Okay, we might have lost contact with Eman. Um, Okay, thank you very much, Eman, um, for, for joining remotely and for your, your wonderful presentation. We will move on to the next, um, which is Reiner. Reiner Frosa is going to present on estimating somatic growth from maximum age or maturation. Um, over to you, Reiner. Uh, I think so we need to stop sharing Eman's screen and allow Reiner to share his screen. So I'm waiting for something to show. So we can see your screen um, here. You just need to go into presentation mode and we can hear you fine. Okay, but I cannot see it. <laughs> This micros PowerPoint is not restart responding well. Yeah, it does look a bit grayed out as if it, oh no, now we've got it. So it's doing something. So that looks okay. Great, over to you. Thanks, Ryan. Okay, then let me just move something here out of the screen. Okay, now I'm ready. Okay, thank you everybody. Uh, and here's my presentation. So um, somatic growth, as we heard uh, from Thanasis, is an important parameter, uh, important information in fisheries management and conservation. And uh, let me see. Okay, that's what it says here. And basically. It has co-evolved with maturation, maximum age, mortality, generation time, and the intrinsic rate of population growth. These are all key parameters that in the end determine how fast the population is growing. And that means how, how much you can take out without depleting them too much. And therefore growth parameters are a required input in stock assessment. However, growth is unknown for most species in fish base, sea life base, mainly because the difficulty of, of accurate age readings, as we saw in the previous presentation, that is uh, reading age from otoliths or from other hard structures, is prone to errors and usually comes with very, very wide ranges of possible ages. So uh, I thought about simplifying this. Uh, that is one, maybe one of my hobbies to try to simplify complicated methods for stock assessment. And uh, here we go. And uh, I, I show what we did for getting estimates of, of growth from stuff that we normally do know somehow. Now the from Bedellinvi growth equation is, has been shown before by Thanasis. You can solve it for the parameter k, which I did here. And then basically, if you know the age, then all you need to know is the ratio between the current length and the asymptotic length L infinity. 
And if you have that, then with this very simple equation, you can estimate um, parameter K. So then the important issue or question is how do you get a prior or a first estimate for the asymptotic length L infinity that you can plug into the equations? And as you know, it is L infinity is the hypothetical length that is approached asymptotically if individuals were to live forever, which they don't. So what does that mean? Um, it, it, we also heard um, that L infinity differs between different populations of a species, and it is typically smaller in warmer waters. Now, how do you get priors for it? For a given population, you can take the largest individual that has been caught in the last 10 to 20 years as an approximation of L infinity. So in other words, the good news is you don't have to do any, any big assumptions or so on. You just take data and to, you could even fix it there. So you take an observation to get a first fix on L infinity. Alternatively, if many data are available from survey programs or from the fishery or from, from angling reports or what have you not, then you can take the median length of the largest individuals that were caught in a period of per year over the past 10, 20 years, or per three years or per five years. And if you take the median of all those values, then you have a more statistical uh, sound estimate of L infinity. And the median is taken here because it has the nice property of uh, ignoring extreme values. So if there is a mismeasurement, the largest one actually was not that large, or in one year there are no big ones were caught, so you have very small values there, the median will ignore those. That's a nice property. Now, second then is, if you have, have an, an, an idea about L infinity, how do you get an estimate of uh, length at H? And for populations with a well-defined spawning season, as we have in temperate areas, but also in areas with strong season, uh, seasonal changes, like such, such as the monsoon area, uh, well-defined spawning season mean that you often know in the subsequent spawning season, uh, the age of the smallest fish that swim around of your species. So if it's a half year, after the previous spawning season, you know they're half a year old. If it's one year, as in our temperate areas, is commonly the place, you know the smallest fish, the young of the year that swim around, are actually one year old. So if you get their mean size, then you know their age, and you have an estimate of LT. Uh, second option is for populations where mean length and age at maturation are known, these can also be used to estimate K. Okay, if you know that they spawn at two years and you still have, have a good, good idea of how large they are at two, at two years to the year after, then, then again, you have an estimate of length and age, a point on the growth curve, so to speak. And finally, for some species, Ah, no, there's a one more. Uh, sometimes you have uh, an extreme year class, either because recruitment has failed before and after the year class, or because it's really outstanding and dominates length frequency plots. Then again, that, that well visible peak in the length frequency plot gives you, um, and, and typically an age, if you know this is a year class from a certain year, well, then you know their age and a length frequency plot will give you the mean length. And finally, if you have, have an estimate of maximum age, because in, of your population, someone has at some point in time taken the largest one caught and read the autolites or something. If you know T max maximum age, and you assume that maximum age typically is, is reached at 95% of uh, asymptotic length L infinity, then the whole equation that I presented simplifies to three over T max. 
And uh, that's not a rule of thumb, really, uh, because it, I think it's it's a good estimation, the 95% L infinity equals to T max. It was proposed by uh, Taylor in, I think, in 1958. And we have checked it out with, with data that we have, and it comes out as, as quite good estimate. So you have four options to estimate uh, length at age. And we did that, and I show here three examples of how we employed that. Here we have, we have lengthened age as ma at mat first maturity taken from fish bays. And uh, we had, we compared here in this graph, uh, 153 newly derived estimates with the method I showed compared to existing estimates, 880 records. And as you see, the black dots are well within the cloud of gray dots we have here on the x-axis maximum length and here the, the k parameter. On the y-axis, this all is in log scale. And then you see the expected decline um, from high k, low maximum length to high maximum length and low k. And they fall well within this ellipse that we would expect. We did the same thing here for a few selected species. For um, actually, they were not they're not they were not cherry picked, but we took the ones the six ones with the highest number of growth estimates. So it's an objective selection of species to look at. And again, the gray dots are existing growth parameters. Same thing: k on the y-axis, l infinity on the x-axis, all in log scale. And the black dots with the um, approximate um, confidence areas are estimated with the new methods. There are sometimes two estimates because for the same length, and uh, we had two different estimates of K that could be male, females, or different years. And that's why sometimes they are shown here two points, but that still is okay. And you see again that the new estimates, simple as they are, uh, data poor as they are, with just one estimate of length at age, fall within the clouds of the other species. So this was on, on maturity. So here we have done the same on, sorry. Yeah, here we have done the same on maximum age, the three over Tmux estimate. And we have 2,800 existing growth estimates, and the black dots again are the ones with the new method. And you see they fall in the center of the other ones. So actually, they have even less variability than the traditional methods. <clears throat> and again, we picked the six species with the highest number of, of growth records, and where we also had Tmax estimates. And you see here in black. The new estimates with confidence limits within the clouds of existing records. And here's one example, I call it a sad example of an extraordinary year class. It's sad because due to severe overfishing for decades, recruitment has failed because the stock is just too small to really uh, be successful at recruitment in, in every year. Um, so we had only here that's caught in the Western Baltic, one remaining good year class from 2016, and it really sticks out. And, and there are recruitment failures, no year classes next to it. So on the sad but uh, useful side, we then knew the, the age of this remaining year class and its mean length with standard deviations even. And so we could estimate growth from it. Now, now, this then is a, why is it so important and what, are, are, what does it mean for management? And the, the black curve you see here is length at age curve, the von Bertelland free growth curve in length. But you see it has no in itself, no obvious points, reference points that you could refer to. It has no in, inflection for example, which would have a meaning for management. Growth in length doesn't have it, but growth in body weight has it. 
and and the maximum increase in body weight, so the maximum weight in grams that is added to the existing body weight, happens at about two third of L infinity. So we call that L opt because that is the point where where somatic growth has reached its maximum, and that is actually where you should fish, because with the giving fishing effort, that is where you get the highest catch. Okay. And also for the highest catch, you kind of kill the least number of fish, which is good for preservation and stable catches in the future. And also, if you have an MK ratio of roughly 1.5, which is a good uh, approximation of, of, of a mean MK ratio, then at this point also called biomass is largest. That is the number of individuals multiplied by their body weight. And uh, taking consideration that some of them die from natural causes, you end up, that's the M here, natural mortality, you end up with a peak in cohort biomass. And since these are mature fish, it is also the peak in cohort fecundity. And since this is then the age, the mean age of the parents at reproduction, that is the definition of gener generation time. So this L opt, as I've published somewhere, is really the most important point in the life of a species with indeterminate growth. This is where you should catch them. This is their natural age of parents. And if you start catching them here, would catch them here, then that is also the mean age in the catch, and you preserve their, their um, genetic variability, diversity. Uh, which is highly important for resilience against climate change. Now, there's another point here that is new, and, and Daniel might like that, because if you look at the growth of, of areas, um, then you have the, the maximum increase in areas of a species that grows according with this length curve is actually the half of maximum length. So this is where the increase, for example, in gill area will be maximum. So this is another important point in life. And it turns out that many fish species, those with parental care, for example, will start to reproduce at this point and then continue reproducing. And I also detected another point, which is here the, the maximum difference between increase in surface area and increase in body weight is actually here. So while body weight is only, I don't think I recall the numbers correctly, but something like 15% of maximum um, gill area is al already 45% of its maximum, meaning they have relatively high gill area, but from this point onward, since the rates then are, this gap is decreasing, Basically, they should start feeling a, a lack of oxygen supply, an increasing lack of oxygen supply from this point, which I call choke, CHK for choke. So, and this happens that it's a quarter of uh, maximum length, L infinity, roughly. This happens to be the earliest maturation that we observe in bony fish. This is where cod start reproducing at a quarter of maximum length. This is where the highly fecund species with thousands or even millions of eggs start their reproduction as lottery players. They want to re reproduce as often as possible. So they start early and they happen to start around here. Okay, this is the background of this, my peak preview paper that I'm working on. And you see here over length, the tradition, the, the well-known growth curve in body weight, the maximum at Two thirds of maximum length. And this is a not well known curve, at least I didn't know. It's a parabola. And that is the growth in areas, growth rate in areas. It has a maximum at half of L infinity. And if you look at the difference between these rates, this has a maximum here. And that was my choke point. Okay. So this is something I'm still thinking about. Can one really do this, compare these rates, given that? Somehow these are relative to their maxims and so on and so on. Maybe one assumption to many. If someone has comments on that, please let me know before I make a fool of myself. But that's just a peak preview I wanted to share. 
Okay, so my conclusions. As we all know, growth parameters K and L infinity are important for conservation and management. Several simple methods are available to estimate K L infinity. FishBase intends to show prior estimates for K L infinity for all species. A paper that Daniel pressures me uh, for years to finally start writing. It's 90% done, but as you know, the last 10% take the longest time. And so the good news from the method that I presented, the journal Acta Ecologia et Piscatoria accepts publications with first estimates of K and L for fish that are derived with the methods that I presented today. Thank you. Great, thanks very much, Rainer. Um, fascinating stuff as always. Uh, is there any immediate questions from the floor? Let me have a look. Yes, Daniel. You'll notice the, the fact that um, spawning occurs according to Reiner's independent method before growth is maximized in weight. That's the, the statement that I made. Therefore, it cannot be the cause for fish to stop growing. They continue, the growth continues to accelerate. And you can find that using various methods, purely empirical, theoretical. You always find it. When you look at the data, that fish starts spawning before the growth starts being reduced. The textbooks say exactly the contrary. That is an odd thing that somehow people have to begin taking into account. And Rainer and I, we are working on a debunking a paper that, that repeated the, the established nonsense in nature. No more, <laughs> they, based on the assumption that, uh, that growth stopped because of reproduction, in spite of the fact that lots of people, lots of people stop growing, never have children that, that they know of. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, yes, Nicola from the back. Yes, Rainer, good, good, uh, good, 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 what? Good afternoon, good morning. Uh, I was considering your your peak preview. Can or you, maybe you think about it already? But we could use that view to present the value on the web in the species summary page. Yes, that is that is that is the plan in the end. Um, but yeah, it, it should have been done uh, last year. But uh, we're working on it. Maybe it gets done next year. But I'm pretty certain that next year we will have priors for growth in our um, parameters estimate with model section. And yeah, that, that's the end goal of it all. That's true. Right now, I had a question just on the L optimum. Um, yes. Have you looked into how close to that value current management um, is? sort of operating or is there a way of doing that and, and a kind of a secondary question I suppose is well, what's involved in in trying to um, apply that more thoroughly in in conservation and management yeah it's um, unfortunately not used uh, in, in most fisheries basically fish are, are the, the, the legal lending size is the smallest size that the fishery is catching more or less so as, as usual, in, in politicians looked at what is currently used. OK, let's use that then as a limit. So, so it's often half of that. As I, as, so in, in cod, it's, uh, which can go one, one meter 20 here in the Western Baltic, the uh, official minimum landing size is 35 centimeters. OK, so we are with this 25% of maximum length, more or less. And that's very similar in many, many other species. So it's, Silly, it's stupid. Um, that 
Sidney Hall already published what I'm showing you here in the 50s. So it's well known that there's an optimum size, but uh, management decided to ignore that fact. And for fisheries management in developing countries, um, actually, if they would just look at size management and start and, and increase that to L opt, then overfishing would mostly end. And that is again something that Sydney Hall showed, I think, in 1958. He said, if, even if all fish, which is impossible, of course, were taken at L, L opt, that would actually be sustainable management because all of them have already reproduced before that point. Okay, and you would get the maximum theoretical maximum catch. Now, obviously, we don't we don't want to do that. The typical rate you take out is maybe thirty percent in the tropics. Uh, so 30, 35 percent you can take out every year and it will regrow and you can take it out again. And you've take out that that percentage at L op, you get the maximum catch that you can get with your effort and its fishery. So that is one of these well truths that are out there which are ignored by management and which would be very beneficial and would simplify management a lot if they were finally applied. And the background to all of that, if some people want to cite it or use it, it's in my minimi minimizing impact of fisheries paper a few years back that you find in my personal page. Great, thanks, Rainer. I think I, with my question, I, I preempted one that was online anyway about clarifying, you know, growth parameters and fish management. So I think you've answered that well. Uh, any last questions for Rainer? Before we move on to the last presentation of the day, one more from Nicola. Yes, um, I, I, I don't remember if we ever discussed about, about that or you, you talk about that. Is there a, a difference uh, for fishes that reproduce only once? Yeah, yeah I skipped it. So uh, semiparous fish that produce only once in their life, when do they reproduce? And actually, uh, it has been predicted uh, don't get the rest right now, um, that they maximize their offspring and their fitness if they reproduce exactly at L opt. Okay, and that has to do with the uh, with the uh, cohort biomass, which also in this species reaches its maximum at L opt. And so they would have a maximum number of eggs, the maximum biomass of the cohort. And that is where they would maximize their, um, their output, the productive output and their fitness if they reproduce there, and they do. I, I have a graph published where I look at uh, no parental care, parental care, and uh, only one time reproduction, uh, all the data we have on them, and they basically confirm what I just said. So some of our species reproduce only once, and they do that around L opt. Great, thanks very much, Rainer. Good to see you, and uh, yeah. and thanks for your presentation. Okay. Uh, we are moving on to uh, Elizabeth Arnaud, uh, who is online with us also, calling in from France, I believe. Yes. Hi, Elizabeth. Can you hear us? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. So we uh, have a good connection. Good morning or good afternoon. So I'm sharing at the moment. Uh, what, bear with me a minute. Can you see my screen? It's we not can. Yet. Okay, it's not yet in slideshow, sorry. I'm doing that now. Just uh, there with my computer. Yes, and I am at the last, sorry, I am at the last <laughs> slide, which should be. Should That's be. okay. Um, so Elizabeth is calling in. Um, from the Alliance of Biodiversity and SEAT. Um, and I, I work with Elizabeth a little bit on ontologies for fisheries and aquaculture, which she's going to present for us uh, today. Over to you, Elizabeth, thank you. Thank you, Alex, sorry for this. Um, yeah, so thank you for inviting me to present the work we have been doing uh, indeed with World Fish about the small scale fisheries and aquaculture ontology for labeling uh, fish science data. The work is done in the context of uh, our community of practice for ontologies. 
um, sorry, try to change this file. Here. Okay, so the context why why we did start uh, this ontology, I will I will explain what it is just after. But um, the Wallfish uh, group came to us because uh, first the data manager because of the rapid development of the digitalization of research in fishery and aquaculture sector and the huge number of multidisciplinary research data uh, that are generated, uh, included surveys. And most of the time, those data can be found online uh, on repositories, uh, can be stored in database, but they are not easily findable and uh, reusable because there's no real uh, standardization of, of their annotation or description. And as you must know, all of you, um, there is now the fair data principles that have been published and are applied and even recommended uh, uh, or it's even a requirement from donors, is that uh, data should be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And to do that, among other principles, you have to describe well your data using a clear metadata format uh, that is standardized. And of course, you, you need to use uh, control vocabularies that the, validated by domain experts. Uh, and then uh, terms should be uh, qualified and uh, have references. So what is an ontology? An ontology, uh, in fact, provides a, a shared vocabulary for a knowledge domain. So in your case, uh, we started with a sm uh, small scale fisheries and aquaculture, for example. Uh, it has to bear textual definitions of the intended meaning of the term. So there's no ambiguity about the use and what they cover, uh, the terms that what they cover. Um, we need to have standard uh, with a reusable identifier. So each concept should bear a unique identifier to help with a, a machine readable uh, format. Uh, each term is semantically related to the other, so this is what we call the semantic axioms, and this will guide any uh, search function uh, or algorithm to make the proper connection between the concept about an event and uh, an effect, about a process or an entity. Uh, also, it facilitates the uh, publication of data aggregation because you are annotating various data uh, with a, a, in a similar way, or you are clearly describing how they have been captured, for example. So this facilitates the aggregation of data for analytical purpose or just for um, multidisciplinary platforms. So when you use an ontology, data are shared, understood among scientists with a, a, a diminished uh, ambiguity. Um, they are integrated easily with existing resources, searchable and of better quality. It's part of your quality check, in fact, when you want to produce quality data, quality fair data. So when we started the work, we looked at what exists and we saw that uh, we have FISHO, which is a fish ontology, but uh, more focused on ichthyology, diversity and adaptation. So quite related to the topic of this session, in fact. We just found draft ontology started by FAO, but they were not uh, achieved. Uh, the Agrovectorosaurus provide uh, many uh, concept, but it's a thesaurus, so the semantic relationships are, the, are just hierarchical, and sometimes there's no definition. Uh, the thesaurus on aqua aquatic science and fisheries abstract as far also provides lots of terms, but it's the same, it's a thesaurus, and it's being anyway integrated in Agrovoc. And we had um, an ecosystem of uh, ontology already existing, like the agronomy ontology or environmental ontology that provides already well, very well defined on environment or uh, management practices, and it's apply, it applies very well uh, on, on fish science. So the team that started the work uh, two years ago is on this slide. So you, you see that we, have the we had the contribution of uh, experts of domains. So Alex was leading the, the team on the world fish side, but at least we had a, a specialist of fisheries, a geneticist, a specialist of fish nutrition. Uh, fish nutrition. So it was quite di diverse and it was very useful to collect the, the knowledge and the concept. 
Um, on our side, we, we have been working together with Marie-Angélique Laporte, who is an ontology expert. Uh, and we had a master student, Tusnuva Jahan, and a consultant, Darin Superio, in Philippines. So this new ontology, in fact, uh, started by the, the design of a knowledge no, uh, model, which is on, on the right side, uh, based on the expert knowledge, of course. But we also um, looked at uh, papers, data sets, thesaurus, so a lot of uh, uh, reference resources. So at the moment, we extracted 380 uh, concepts, which are related by semantic relationship or what we call the semantic axioms. Uh, the terms uh, and the relationship were validated by domain experts. And now we are in the work of adding definitions. So a certain amount of definitions are already there, but we really need the domain expert to validate also the definitions or provide their definition in the context of the use. And we have been also extracting terms from existing ontology, as I said, like uh, agricultural process from the agronomy ontology, fertilizer from the chemical ontology, uh, the quality of uh, the water from environmental ontology, et cetera. So what we was really helpful is uh, the project of Alex Kolpeskas, uh, uh, which is a a near real-time monitoring and analytic system for small-scale small scale fisheries. Um, they, they have already developed um, conceptual design of the database and the relation between the concept. And this has been a, a very good basis for, for starting and developing further the, the, the knowledge model for the ontology. Um, and then the result is currently under a software called Protégé, which is an ontology development software used by Marie-Angélique Laporte. Uh, we also have an online um, version, but it's on, for the moment accessible only with a password. So we have plans to publish this, release this ontology publicly, of course. So the work for, for this ontology was to first create the large class uh, so uh, we have, for example, agricultural process, uh, aquaculture trial, um, gear. So those large class uh, create that with the, the experts. And then we added uh, the specific concept. And you can see on the right side of the screenshot, each term has a definition with the source of the definition, which makes, of course, the, the term more reliable and trustable. Uh, then uh, the ontology at the moment uh, includes a concept from aquaculture trials, fish nutrition, disease detection, fish characteristics. And the fish characteristics, of course, echoes the presentation just we had before. And so for the, um, for the curation of the definitions, uh, we have worked with the uh, Alex team mainly and our consultant, uh, Daryl uh, Superio, and we, uh, had, we did it through an Excel file at the moment. We have another mean for submitting terms, but here the, the idea was really to move on with good definitions and insert that in the ontology. So this is the way we work. So we have a validation column and we have a label for the term, uh, a definition, and we indicate uh, the concept uh, class or subclass and the reference where the definition was uh, found and the DOI. And each term, as, as you see, has a unique ID called the OBO identifier that uh, reflect its number in the ontology and can be machine readable. So where we are now um, and the next steps, uh, it's to publish uh, the draft of the ontology we have uh, on GitHub. So it's already there. In fact, we have a GitHub link. Uh, Marie-Angélique is managing this GitHub and we would like to engage more experts in the validation of the concept or submission of concept as well. So on the GitHub, for those who knows, you have a, a, an issue tracker. So you can create, in fact, a message called an issue. And you can submit a, a term or flag a definition that is not adequate in your sense. And then it creates a curation process uh, with us, with our team. So you need to have a GitHub account. 
but if you need some help to do that, uh, we you just contact us. Our contacts are on the last slide. The next step is to integrate the fish-based taxonomy to make sure we have a reliable taxonomy of fish um, into the ontology. And we would like, as I said, to publish the draft version in the World Fish website, and this should occur before the end of the year. And we would like to define new use case, meaning having some data sets coming from other sources and check if the ontology really um, is adequate to annotate uh, those uh, data sets. Thank you for listening and uh, I hope you can contact us to, to have um, more, more information about the ontology. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Elizabeth. That's lovely seeing it all laid out. It makes far more sense to me now as well. <laughs> um, do we have any questions from the floor on the ontology? Yes, Daniel. One sec, the mic is just coming. We have created for FishBase um, uh, a glossary, a glossary that multi-language for all the terms that uh, are in the fish base book and are relevant to fish base. Now, um, what this does this ontology with regard to fish? I, I don't, I don't want to talk about agriculture or any other sector. But what does it add? To, what does it add to us, to to the work of? Is it is it is it uh, does it add clarification? Of concept does it does it help us and if 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 so how thank you for your question yeah indeed um glossaries are controlled vocabularies and usually those are the forms uh, the the sources for an ontology in fact if you already have a, a well validated glossary by your community, it makes uh, an added value as a resource to, to integrate into the ontology. The advantage of having an ontology and integrates the control vocabulary with the validation of experts is you are really creating a um, semantic resource that is first, um, um, I, would I would say semantically organized. So your terms have a relationship between, for example, um, you add um, a nutritional pack in aquaculture in the water, you can uh, relate uh, that this process has an effect on the growth of the fish, for example. So it, it captures the knowledge also of the relationship between the concept, in fact. But uh, a glossary like yours could easily be, um, in fact, integrated into the ontology. All the sources are cited. It's not a, a way of capturing or absorbing uh, control vocabulary developed by others. It's more to use what exists and make citation. So each concept is, is linked to its source. So if you have a way of sharing this glossary, we could discuss together. And then the ontology will help you also developing, um, I would say, larger global search functionalities to search for data that have been annotated uh, um, by an ontology and mine and discover new data because the system will use the semantic relationship. So the system can infer data sets that uh, you may not think about, but you will find, find by associating concepts. But if you like, uh, you can contact us and we can look at your glossary and see what would be the added value of integrating it in the ontology. Thank you. Our glossary, the fish based glossary, if it is any use by you appear to belong to, you can take it because we have generated it also for multiplicity of sources and uh, it, it is basically stored in good and uh, we, we will we'll share it. So you can take our glossary uh, that has been verified by Rhino, myself, and lots of other people and, and incorporate it in, into this. This uh, uh, ontology, um, okay. if it is any use. 
Yeah, we, we will look at it, we will check. And uh, of course, the, answer, the integration of concept is done with the validation of experts. So they may select part of it, or they may say, okay, let's just absorb everything. We will, we will see, we, I don't know how long or how much concept your glossary contains. Fantastic. Yeah, it's definitely um, a, a next step for us. We are lacking quite a lot of concepts just because, as Elizabeth mentioned, we started just with the Pescas infrastructure, which is fairly small and only at the moment related to Timor. And so there's obviously many different types of fishing gears, you know, aspects that are not uh, in that system. So, yeah, it's, it's a good step forward to integrate the, the fish based glossary. Uh, Jessica and then to Rhina online. So I was interested about what you said about it involves concepts, right? And one of the things I'm curious about is we know that science is a contest of ideas. And uh, Daniel's just been reminding us about how most biologists have it wrong about growth. Does developing an ontology, moving beyond just having a vocabulary, does that have the risk of cementing concepts in place that are perhaps still being contested? Um, that's a good question, but the fact that we, we base normally the integration of concept on expert knowledge, if there is still a debate on, on the concept and the context of use, uh, we can hold on before integrating it officially in the ontology. However, an ontology can capture more, more I would say, context of use or vision than just a thesaurus because you have a, a semantic relationship, but you can also capture synonyms. You can describe how you use it. So the context of use may help you capturing various visions. So it depends if your objective is really to harmonize uh, the way data are described with a reference ontology or glossary that everybody uses, or if you want to capture diver diverse way of uh, describing uh, or measuring or using uh, the variable on growth, uh, the ontology can help with that. It's just a matter of the community to decide how to capture that semantically. I hope I answered your question. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, Rainer, uh, online. Yes, um, I personally think ontologies are actually a wonderful idea. Uh, also for translation, which is a major issue in fish space, and also for clarity. And one can see in Wikipedia how they link certain words to other entries. It's not an ontology, but it's another article about the concept and so on. But my, my problem is, is a bit being around for a while in the community. Uh, there have been attempts to, to implement ontologies uh, over the past two, three decades. And uh, I I, I heard about them similar to, to I hear you today when they were in the early phases, but I never heard of them later and I didn't see them succeed in a way. So, so I just wonder, have you, have you looked at that history of ontologies and maybe is there a lesson to learn? You cannot force them on a community, as you know, they have to be adopted voluntarily. Yes, journals could adopt them and have something run over articles and see what, what terms are there and are they all used properly. And I think that would be a good idea in a way for checking uh, that, that people use. use. But it's, it's, it has not been taken on board. And so I, I wonder what you think about that. How optimistic are you that your, your effort, which is considerable, it's a considerable effort to do this, uh, will pay off. Yeah. So perhaps Alex has his own uh, answer to that. But um, in fact, the, the effort of doing the, this ontology was uh, in the context of our community of practice developing ontologies for agriculture. So we have the experience of other ontologies that are taking off, like uh, the crop trait ontology, which is an ontology really dedicated to breeding system is rather popular and in use in databases. Uh, but it took, uh, yeah, it was developed over long time and it was mainly promoted by the use of the ontology inside uh, the databases used to produce field book. So I think the, the 
adoption of ontologies is very much supported by the digitalization of science. Because when you produce um, digital tools, you, you need a way of labeling your data. And uh, the ontology really had that for breeding, crop breeding, for example. And now they are using that uh, more easily when they want to do machine learning, in fact, because data are properly labeled and they are labeled up to the unit of measurement. That was the problem of uh, Athanasius. Uh, so it helps if you have the tools to adopt uh, the ontology or make at least use of it. So it can be a digital field book or lab book. It can be also a multidisciplinary platform that is using the knowledge graph behind. So this way, the, the ontologies are adopted and then scientists do contribute. We can see that also with the agronomy ontology, which is linked to a, a field book for agronomists. And uh, now we receive more contribution of concept. Um, so the past effort, I think, are, are really good. And we can also reuse some of their concepts. The only thing is you really need a community behind. You really need to identify the needs for that. So that's why, of course, the, the interest of Alex with this monitoring system was really helpful because this is the type of uh, project where they need to compile many data coming from diverse sources and in several languages. So, so I think the, the ontologies are really useful if you have the tools to, to use it and it's transparent for the end user. The, the data are labeled in the backend, for example, and not directly. That's one way. Uh, and as you see, uh, we, you have more and more project, uh, European project, for example, that are embedding the development of ontologies into the, the data management plan to, some, to help with the annotation. So I'm rather optimistic because I've been working for, for that uh, a long time. And Marie-Angelique, who is connected also, she, she, uh, she's an expert in ontology. So we know it's quite an undertaken, that, um, an undertaking, sorry. but once it's published, it can also be open to the community and the, the tool uh, is living. Thanks, Elizabeth. Yeah, I agree. Uh, in response to you, Rainer, I think the it, you're absolutely right. You can't force people to use it. I mean, my my involvement in it started, uh, as was mentioned, because of, of Pescus, but also because of a kind of vision of within the CGIR or, or even World Fish and our country offices and different people starting up apps and monitoring systems of fisheries and even of aquaculture um, systems, having everyone kind of use the same concepts and, and it, are using them with the knowledge that they meant a certain thing um, was valuable even within the institution. Um, but then as, as Elizabeth mentioned, looking beyond that and the future of machine learning and big data and, and these new approaches coming in, it will be increasingly important to be able to um, have a kind of coherent, synchronized approach into what these concepts mean. And so I guess time will tell, but in this is kind of digital age, if you will. I think they will need these tools that that work without constant oversight and and the ability to kind of pick up terms and and make sure they they mean what we think they mean. Um, yeah. Any? Yes, Nicola. Hello, Elizabeth. It's uh, Nicola Bailly speaking. Nice to meet you again. Again, yes, I know you. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Nicola. Uh, uh, well, we we have seven thousand and two hundred terms in, in the glossary, okay. but I, I think not everything is, is relevant. You you will need to to choose. Uh, so I can send that to you, uh, and also for the taxonomy, we need. To discuss, to discuss a little bit what you want to include uh, in, in that. So I, I am still uh, around for the week and we have some free time. So maybe it would be worse to have a, a, a Zoom with uh, Alex while I'm here so we can finalize this and it will be finished. Yeah, good suggestion, Nicolai. 
if you are the primary contact for, for those. Yeah, okay. Uh, yes, wages, but oh, for sure, not all seven uh, 7,000 terms are, are, are translated in all the language that we have. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great, more collaborations happening in situ. Yeah, we'll sort that out, Elizabeth. Uh, any parting questions or thoughts? Um, there's nothing online. Thanks a lot, Elizabeth. Thanks for joining us. I hope it's not too early. No. Um, it's the, the end of our day here, so. <laughs> it was a long day. Thank you very Thank much. You. For yes, take care. Bye-bye. All right, and from uh, from us, that is the end of our day here, uh, the end of our schedule. Thanks everyone for sticking with it. Um, if there is anyone that would like to have a wander around, um, I think Hafiz is gonna uh, take you around. There were some points, if um, anyone has been, um, how do I say this, in contact with any fish farming facilities uh, or labs in the last three days, <laughs> you're not allowed to go uh, in case of contamination. Um, uh, but other than that, everybody's welcome to have a tour around. Otherwise, the time is, time is your own and we'll see you back here uh, in the morning. Our schedule starts um, from nine o'clock and we'll start off uh, with a presentation from Cristiano, which is talking a bit about the, the current World Fish Initiative, the Aquatic Foods Initiative and Aquadata, um, and then go on to a, a few more talks on, on growth and morphology, um, conservation of endangered species, uh, and, and so on. So lots more to look forward to. Thanks a lot for your attention today, and do let me know any questions. Thanks. Bye, all.